Mate 40 here. So right before I press start on my Streamlabs OPS, you know, I just feel like I'm standing in a in a roomy field, and I, I'm like uh, the, the Meryl Streep character, right, in the movie Plenty. Right, she was a fighter in the resistance against the Nazis during World War II. She had this important role to play, and towards the end of the, the war she was standing in this beautiful french field with a farmer and she the sun's shining down and she like spreads out her her hands and says something like to the effect uh, soon there will be plenty and so that's how i often feel before i, I start live streaming it's like soon there will be plenty i have all these ideas these you know creative bursts i i you know just have so much to say i have so many you know hilarious uh, jokes to tell you and then as soon as I press, you know, start stream, <laughs> then it goes from feeling of plenty to feeling like I'm living in post-World War II austere Great Britain, right? Austerity is kicking in. You still got rationing. Britain's still desperate to pay off all its debts to the United States. And instead of feeling like I'm standing in a roomy field, like I feel like I'm standing on the precipice, right? Right on the edge of a cliff. And all that space that I thought I had, it just kind of shrinks down because I'm concerned. Like, how's my sound quality? That's my number one concern when I start a live stream is how's my sound quality? Then I want to make sure, oh, am I transmitting? <laughs> right? So I appear to be transmitting right now to my Facebook page, to my Facebook uh, profile, to YouTube, to Rumble, to Odyssey, and to Twitter. So I'm transmitting. And then I want to make sure that I have, you know, things lined up where if I suddenly blank on uh, what I want to talk about, I can just you know, press play on something else and catch my breath. Now, if I start to hit my stride in the stream, I start to feel like there's, you know, a little bit more space in my room. But it's really hard to be creative when your RAM is being used up. So I think on my computer, I think I've got 16 gigabytes of, of RAM. Does that, does that sound right? And the more things that you have going on with your computer, right, the more of the energy is getting used up. And so eventually your computer slows down, slows down until you shut down all programs and restart. And so every time you run a program on your computer, it seems to take up, you know, RAM. And that just leaves you less space to do the things that you want to do. And so too with doing a live stream, right, for every little bit of attention I pay to the sound levels and whether I'm transmitting here or there or pay to the chat or pay to breaking news. All right, I, I get distracted from the things that I want to say. And so it's just <laughs> amazing how much I change when the situation changes. All right. <laughs> I, I, can, I usually go into a stream like feeling happy, feeling confident, feeling fecund, filled with ideas. And then I start this, the stream and it's like, oh, no, I don't want to go there. All right. I often start the stream with the idea, oh, I want to talk about this demanding, morally demanding, factually demanding, intellectually complex uh, topic. And, and then I get into the streams like, oh, I just don't have the energy to do that. And then if I have some good interactions on the stream with the chat or with a guest, uh, or I, I feel confident because I've, I've just given over something the way I, I dreamed of, then I start getting more expansion. Also, if I use the Alexander technique, so let go of everything I think I know. Ah. Uh, that's good. Just kind of free the neck, free the face, you know, let go of all my conceptions about how reality should be, and then just return to the present moment, right? By letting go of that unnecessary muscular tension, letting go of my habits of tightening, compressing, pulling down with, with my musculature, then that opens up not just more room and space in my body, but also in my mind and in my emotions. So I was up at 4.30 a.m. and eager to get started with my day. And I treated myself to a cup of coffee. I don't think I've had a cup of coffee in about two weeks. So it was very exciting to have a cup of coffee and then get a buzz. So I had a decent night's sleep. Not great, but decent. And then a cup of coffee. And then I think I got my nootropic stack right. I, I took my modafinil. I had my cold shower. Then I had my cup of coffee. And then I followed it up with some L-theanine, the supplement, which uh, supposedly makes the caffeine high last uh, twice as long. So a normal caffeine high lasts about two hours or so. But uh, with L-theanine, I find, I think, I believe it lasts four, five, six hours. So 
I am now five hours on since having my, my cup of coffee. And so, you know, what kind of bloke gets up at 4.30 a.m. on a Sunday morning? Someone who loves, guys. Someone who wants to contribute to your life. Someone who wants to pass on important insights. Someone who wants to engage in social learning with you. Who wants to struggle with difficult ideas. Or maybe it's someone who's insecure and wants your adoration. Or if not your adoration, at least your attention. Uh, so I, I think all of those are factors for me. I I don't have kids, right? I don't have a family of my own. So those normal outlets that, that normally healthfully take up most of your attention, right? I don't have. And so I spend more time uh, pursuing ideas, pursuing my blogging, pursuing my, my live streaming, uh, pursuing excitement than I would if I had family obligations. But you can you can get a little bit of an intimation uh, of what it's like to have a family and you can get a little bit of an intimation of the, the calming effect of a normal, healthy family life if you are, say, adopted into, you know, semi-adopted into another family. So I'm a convert to Orthodox Judaism, and there have been various Orthodox Jewish families that have effectively, you know, adopted me into their home. They invite me over regularly for Sabbath meals, for holiday meals. Uh, you know, I feel a part of things. Their children like me. I'm a rough house with the, the boys. I you know, shared jokes, I'm, you know, I'm made to feel part of the family. And so if you have that experience, right, it does have somewhat of a, a calming effect on what is otherwise a desperate need for excitement, for attention, for admiration, for, you know, proving that you matter. So I don't know if you have any children in your life, but let's say you're walking down the street with your mate and your mate's like holding you know, his, uh, say, seven-year-old boy's hand as he walks down the street. And then, like, his, say, three-year-old boy, he, he, like, reaches out and takes your hand, right? That's, like, an amazing feeling. You just get a little intimation of what it's like to be important to someone, to be trusted by someone, to just a little intimation of what it's like to, to be a father, to be normal, to have to have a family. And it's just incredibly calming. So... I've found that when I've been effectively adopted into a home, that's just calm me down. I'm much less likely to act out in bizarre, you know, attention-seeking, weirdo, or desperate, desperate ways. Uh, I was looking at an article in the LA Times this morning about uh, a 12-year-old kid who just uh, graduated right, from, from Fullerton College with five degrees. All right, now... Yeah, they're five associate degrees, but still, being 12 years of age, uh, graduating from Fullerton College, all right, with, with five associate degrees is extraordinary. And so the drive to be extraordinary can be adaptive or maladaptive, all right? If, if uh, someone like this kid with this you know, level of high achievement uh, goes into a total collapse, all right, obviously this level of, of striving was maladaptive, but if he goes on to a healthy, happy, fulfilling, productive life, then it was, it was a good thing. So apparently at age seven, he was bored with second grade. He wanted more of a challenge. So his mother pulled him out of second grade and began homeschooling him. Then a year later, when he was nine, he enrolled in Fullerton College, right? And she attended classes with him. And at one point, he was taking 11 units, the maximum allowed for students in the special admit program which provides them with a taste of college and allows them to simultaneously enroll in classes while attending high school and so now he's graduating on saturday with the 2023 class at fullerton college being the youngest person in the college's 108 year history to receive a degree so i kind of identify with this kid in that at age 11 and 12 i was running marathons and so i was training five six seven eight you know miles a day up to 50 hours 50 miles a week and my parents did not want me to do that, right? It, it's hard to believe that that kind of distance running is good for a kid, good for an adult, let alone a kid. But I had this desperate, desperate need to be distinctive. I was literally trying to run away from my unhappiness. I, you know, wasn't getting along that well at, at school. My, my seventh grade teacher suggested to me that, you know, I get homeschooled because I was just so obnoxious. There were, there were two occasions when I told her to shut up. And she let me know that was totally unacceptable. 
And then I, I got so scared by that suggestion of being homeschooled that uh, I, I started behaving myself better. But for me, my extreme running was very much trying to run away from my unhappiness. Now, people can live stream, people can blog, people can create, people can strive from a place of unhappiness or a place of happiness and contentment. And usually those who are coming from a place of happiness and, and contentment will tend to make better decisions than those who come from, from a bizarre place. So my, my opening topic is, uh, is hate facts, right? You know, when is it appropriate to talk about painful, hateful facts? When is it inappropriate? And I guess I was kind of inspired this morning. I, I got a $50 donation, so I could do like an hour's worth of, uh, you know, just regular work and, and make $50. But uh, normally when I, I live stream, I probably make about you know, 4 or $5 an hour. I got a, a $50 contribution, yes, over the weekend and... The man said, great show. I just read a terrific book you might enjoy that teaches a lot of 40 principles about realism and situationism. It's called Between the Alps and a Hard Place by Angelo Cotevilla. Yeah, it's a book about Switzerland and its situation in World War II. So Switzerland at one point by 1940 was surrounded by Nazi-dominated Europe, was in danger of being invaded by Nazi Germany. And Nazi Germany had an absolute stranglehold on Switzerland importing the food, and the energy that it needed to survive. So Switzerland had to basically accommodate the Nazis. At the same time, Switzerland was heavily dependent on trade with the Allies. So Switzerland had to try to you know, chart a course between Nazi Germany and the Allies. And part of survival was that it had to make itself as difficult to conquer as possible. So it devised a military plan where the primary amount of its armed forces would withdraw from most of the country and just go up you know to the alps to the most easily defensible areas and so switzerland had to make a lot of really tough decisions which it, it's easy to condemn now but if you're in their situation right it, you, you would have you would have made a lot of compromises as well right <laughs> i would just imagine having like being surrounded by nazi germany and then absolutely depending upon Nazi Germany to be able to import the, the food and the you know, energy sources that you absolutely needed for your survival. So when the war was going well for Nazi Germany, then Nazi Germany was able to demand that Switzerland provide it with, say, munitions and whatever Nazi Germany wanted on credit. Then by 1943, when the war started going badly for Nazi Germany, then Switzerland was able to demand payment in kind. So Switzerland's reaction to Nazi Germany depended a great deal on the situation. So when Nazi Germany was strong, and this is the way the world works, when countries that surround you or have power to hurt you are strong, you have to accommodate them, even if they're evil, right? even if they're heinous, even if they're wicked, even if they're vainglorious, even if they're deluded, even if they're racist, sexist, homophobic, you still have to accommodate them, right? You have to accommodate others in real life, depending on their ability to hurt you. So you walk down the street and a homeless man comes at you with a knife and demands that you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, right? You have to accommodate him or risk, risk death, right? If your boss demands you know, certain codes of conduct, you have to accommodate your boss if you want to keep that job. If your spouse demands you know, certain behaviors and abstention from other behaviors, if you want to keep that spouse, you have to comply. So the more power people have to hurt you, right, the more vulnerable you are to, to others, the more you have to accommodate them. Then in the 1990s, all these Jewish organizations somehow got to the Clinton administration. The Clinton administration told Switzerland that the United States would make its life very difficult unless various Swiss banks turned over something like $1.8 billion to these private Jewish charities that were ostensibly all about providing for Holocaust survivors. And so Switzerland was squeezed by the might of the United States into you know, turning over $1.8 billion to you know, various Jewish activist groups. And uh, did, did Switzerland deserve to have to do that? No. I mean, Switzerland 
enabled you know thousands upon thousands of Jews to survive World War II. Switzerland took in per capita five times as many Jewish refugees as the United States. But because Switzerland's a small country, right, it can often be squeezed by bigger, more powerful countries, just like you and I, right? We're not necessarily the most powerful in demand people in the world. And so situations uh, will come along where we have to accommodate others or we're really going to get hurt. So you don't want to be just dispensing hate facts willy nilly, right? There are all sorts of situations where hate facts are completely, you know, inappropriate. And there are hate facts about each of us, right? You could come down right now with about 15 different hate facts <laughs> in the chat. Things that would be absolutely true about me, but would just be you know, incredibly painful or mortifying for me to handle if, if I'm not in a, you know, a good spiritual space, All right? So I've been in social situations, uh, most notably when I'm like just meeting in a woman that I'm highly attracted to and my male friends or my male acquaintances want to undercut me and they want to like start bringing up, you know, the most ridiculous things I, I've said and done in the past to try to torpedo me for, for whatever reason, to cock block me. And so often they're bringing up things that are completely factual, but unless I'm, yeah, you got to use your hate facts responsibly, bro, bro. So unless I am situated in reality, right? Unless I'm spiritually aligned or just aligned with reality, it's very easy to be thrown off by hate facts. And there are hate facts about you too. So if people brought up hateful facts about you in various social interactions, you would find it devastating. So every community, every individual has a hero system. And if you go against the hero system of your community or against the individual, they're going to react very, very badly. And so you have to be willing to pay a substantial price if you violate an individual's or a community's hero system. However, when it comes to public discussion, particularly of important issues, then uh, hate facts has a role to play if you can handle the consequences, right? A lot of people go online, start dispensing hate facts, and they find out they can't handle the consequences. They don't like being fired from their jobs. They don't like losing friends. They don't like being socially ostracized, doxxed, shamed. They don't like getting death threats, right? They don't like the consequences from violating society's you know, sacred taboos. But if it's a public discussion about you know, matters of the public interest and I noticed that successful, powerful, elite people are constantly invoking the word ugly to try to dismiss topics that they find too powerful and, and too awkward to talk about. And it's really... trying to point the figure and attribute things. And like you said, it's people focus on the atrocities, I suppose, that support their arguments. And yeah, I, I don't have a take to make. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, even when you look at like World War II, where there's kind of a, a general agreed upon view about who the goodies and the baddies were in that war. But when you look at the firebombing of Germany or Japan or the second dropping of a nuclear bomb or why nuclear bombs were not dropped on non in yeah. Fuji. Areas, why not right? put on Mount Fuji to make a point? Yeah, that's, that's my little that's my little historical bug there. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, but there and, and there there just are terrible atrocities, even in a war where there is a much broader agreement about who's in the right and who's in the wrong overall. And 
yeah, it, it's just to underline that point that the reality is always complicated and bloody. And there's always examples to be cited to kind of support whatever interpretation you want to take. But I, I will say that I think, Tariq, it, it's kind of a different point when they're talking about 9-11 and the response to it. And Hitchens is complaining about there not being enough pushback about Hamas's manifesto or whatever it is that mentions the obliteration of Israel and so on. I repeat my question. Who has the authority to issue fatwas? Is it Sheikh Haradawi, who sometimes very much uh, expressed respectful, who on Al Jazeera gives advice on all kinds of things, some of them innocuous, sexual matters and so forth, doctrinal rulings, sometimes upon the legitimacy or otherwise of suicide bombing, if directed at Israelis, not just Jews, of course, but no, no, we draw the distinction. On the other hand, Hamas, which does the suicide bombing, doesn't draw the distinction. If I can't issue a fatwa against Hamas, if I'm a Muslim, if there's no one who will and they won't, surely someone could say, we don't think Hamas should have on its website and manifesto the reproduction of the protocols of the elders of Zion a Christian fascist fabrication that is one of the warrants for the Nazi exterminationist solution. Okay, so that's a, a pretty good argument made by Christopher Hitchens there, except for calling the uh, Protocols of Zion some kind of you know Christian fascist um, thing. All right, it wasn't really about Christianity or fascism. It was about in-groups versus out-groups. I mean, surely that's a question for the UN Anti-Racism Committee on a spare day. Or, or since that spare day never seems to come, for some Muslim authority to say, no, brothers, don't, don't do that. It doesn't come. It doesn't happen. Look on the website. It's still there. But Ramadan makes a point saying that Hitchin says, where are the voices condemning violence in the Muslim world? And Tariq says... Yes, I acknowledge the fact that there is a, a crisis of authority in Islam. But please, don't tell me today that you didn't hear the Muslim voices around the world criticizing and saying this is unacceptable to kill the people in the... Okay, so it's not... Uh a matter of voices, it's a matter of how much resonance and power do the voices have. So what concerns non-Muslims about Islam is that it sure seems like the, the nicest, most moderate uh, Muslims tend to be intimidated by the more extreme Muslims. So not all voices count equally, all right? A, a fatwa from a leading cleric in Iran seems to have you know, more devastating power to disrupt the lives of non-Muslims than the, the proclamations of, of various Muslim academics in, in the West. Like, how much pull over extreme Muslims do, say, Muslim academics in the West have? That's, that's the concern from the non-Muslim perspective, all right? Yes, there are moderate you know, voices in Islam that seem completely compatible with Western civilization, but how much power do they have over the more dedicated, the more violent or the, the more extreme members of the Muslim community. Tweets in, in New York, and the condemnation was widespread by the scholars. If you don't hear, of course, there's, you know, not less than 12 councils of Muslim scholars around the world, from Amman to Istanbul to uh, Paris, Dublin, were condemning this. It's as if they don't speak. Because at the end, when the people are calling to kill, for killing, they are heard. But when people are condemning what is done in the name of their religion, it's as if they don't speak. It doesn't make the headlines. But I'm telling you that some scholars did it and said it, and I was one of them, if you like or not. So I think that's a valid point, right? There were people condemning the violence after 9-11. I would imagine that there are condemnations of the sectarian violence in the Muslim world by various Muslim leaders, including in some of the more like fundamentalist sects, I would imagine, as well. But there's a, there's a kind of little neat way, I think, that Tariq puts it, and he's talking about himself at this point, but I, I think it's a good argument on this. And you know what is very interesting in the, the whole discussion? That when the people like what I'm saying, say, you know what? What he's saying is good, but he's alone. Minority. It's open, but he's... Well, it matters how much power the voice has, right? It's not just a matter of there's a study that says X and a study that says Y. What matters is the quality of the study. And what matters is the power of the individuals who are saying things. He's alone. But when the people don't like what I say, say, you know why? He has huge followers. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I think you can still address, you know, which views are, are predominant within a society or not, right? Like the ones that are less popular or more popular. But I, but I think he is correct that Schrodinger's figure were people can either say they're just like a fringe figure or, well, they're very influential and have a, a, a big following. Yeah. yeah, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Like on one hand, I don't think it's um, a good argument to just carve off extremists or people who do bad things in the name of the ideology that you favor and say, oh no, they don't belong to us. We take no responsibility for them. On the other hand, it's still very much the case that 99.9% .9 of people of any persuasion don't <laughs> commit any violence in the name of the thing that they subscribe to. I mean, it's very much... Yeah, and that's, that's a good point. Also, it's a worthy point to question why is it that say all hijacking since the 1970s uh, at least seem to have been committed committed by muslims yeah the harmful actions of a tiny minority of people 
well, normally, you know, pollute the reputation of that particular group in the eyes of outsiders. That's just how the world works. That's reality, right? We are naturally predisposed towards negative feelings about outgroups when there are tiny numbers of an outgroup that commit you know, disproportionate amount of disruptive, deadly activity. A normal human reaction will be skepticism and negative feelings towards the entire outgroup. Much analogous to the silly thing that's on Twitter at the moment, which is once again, surprise, surprise, Chris, racial politics of the United States has raised its ugly head again. And right, I'm not tweeting at the moment. I'm just, I just look at it occasionally sometimes and then turn it off in disgust. But, you know, there's these debates about crime, right? And, you know, various inflammatory tweets about white on black crime and black on white crime, whatever. But why is that silly? All right. I, I can understand why it's ugly, but calling it ugly and calling it silly is not really a strong argument. If if uh, this Australian academic, Matt Brown, had a strong argument to make here, he would make it. But he doesn't have a strong argument to make, so he resorts to name-calling, saying it's silly or ugly. Yeah, vice versa. And these arguments about statistics and so on, they kind of obscure the fact that, has been rightly pointed out by the various people, that you know, 99.9% .9 of people don't murder anyone, don't commit any crime. Right. Yeah, but let's say that... Uh, you know, one group commits, you know, 50 times as much murder as another group. I, I would expect that, that men, for example, commit 20, 30, 40 times amount as much uh, murder and physical mayhem a as do women. And so women are understandably uh, more concerned about, you know, men in certain situations. Like if a woman's in a parking lot alone and there's, you know, a man walking up behind her, she's going to be far more concerned about that guy because he's male, simply because he's male, than if he were female. Right? She's going to be more concerned if he's young rather than old. Right? Old men don't tend to commit a lot of mayhem. And then you know, other groups of young men commit disproportionately more physical mayhem and violence than other groups. And it's totally normal, natural, and even you know, adaptive and healthy to take note of that. And the argument, well, 99.9% .9 of this group doesn't commit murder, isn't really a, a strong, you know, convincing, calming argument to make when you're in a vulnerable position. So I was talking to someone the other day who, who was young and strong, and then suddenly out of nowhere, some genetic predisposition, like, uh, you know, felled him, right? And so he was strong and felt like he could do anything one moment, and then he had, like, devastating back injury the next moment, not due to anything he'd done, but just due to a genetic, you know, physical vulnerability. And so when you're, when you're vulnerable, all right, it, it makes sense to take notice of the situation and who's in the situation with you, right? Do they have the power, capacity, and the likelihood to hurt you? So if you see someone who's 100 times more likely to commit physical mayhem against you than, uh, than the average, then you'd be silly not to take that into consideration. Right. And so when, when you talk about these categories, whether it's black people, white people, Islamic people, Christian people, it, it, it is meaningful to take account of the fact that you are talking when you talk. Are we in a competition for success, bro? Uh, to some extent, yeah, life is competition. It's a competition for scarce resources, for attention, right? We're in the attention economy. I am competing for your attention right now. You have a thousand other things that you could be watching, doing, listening to taking in right now, but instead you are choosing to watch and, and to listen to me. So I have to compete with, you know, other sources of uh, entertainment or other sources of information or commentary. So yeah, much of life is competition. And those who, you know, navigate competition are going to be more likely to have access to resources and are going to be, you know, more likely to be successful in life. Remember the infamous... Jesse Jackson quip when in a candid lapse he actually said what everyone knows and bases their behavior upon. Yeah, Jesse Jackson said that if he were walking alone in, say, a dangerous part of town, he'd be much more concerned if there were a group of young black men following him than, say, a group of young white men. Talking about extremist acts of violence or crime or, or something extreme, then you are talking about a tiny percentage of any population. Yeah, so I think that's good to keep in mind, but there are also there are arguments about the little Sam Harris ringing in my ear is about the, or Dawkins maybe as well, about, you know, the role of moderates in supporting the more extremist sex. But you can also see it as the role of moderates in diluting the power of the more hardline movements in a religion. So, yeah, I do think there's a tendency to fixate on 
extremes. But there's also the issue that like it's the people at the extremes who tend to do the violent acts or you know be responsible for the rhetoric that accompanies atrocities and, and whatnot. So it's a bit of a to be it back and forth. Yeah, I think what you're saying is that the, is that the radicals of extremists can be given a permission slip by the broader group. I mean, you know, like a good example is the MAGA phenomenon in the United States. Now, I'm sure, you know, like half of America voted for Donald Trump. Maybe half of them have MAGA-esque sympathies. You know, not, not all of them are rushing out to storm the Congress or to, you know, do extreme things. But at the same time, the ideology that they subscribe to kind of gives a permission slip to unbalanced people that want to engage in these things. So Yeah, as soon as you make the argument that the 2020 election is rigged, you are freeing people from moral constraint, right? If the 2020 election was rigged, and I do not believe it was, then you were freed from moral restraint in reacting against it. So Donald Trump and those who echoed his rhetoric about a rigged election did set the grounds for what happened on January 6th. Now, on the other hand, the people who participated, right, they, they chose to engage in illegal behavior and they weren't born yesterday, all right? They weren't, you know, just overpowered by Trumpian rhetoric. It's just that Trumpian rhetoric enabled them, you know, allowed them, released them, freed them up to do the things that they wanted to do, right? They, they wanted to make their voices heard. They wanted to feel, you know, powerful and consequential. You know, they wanted to be at the very center of things. They got to be at the very center of things and now they have to pay the price. So I My basically guy. don't know. Yeah. So you engage in which things? Well, well things like storming the Capitol building or the- Oh, right. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah I, I mean, the reason I was just asking for clarity is in regards, like there's that concept of stochastic terrorism, right? Which is spoken about quite a lot now. And I- So stochastic terrorism means that uh, words and, and ideas that are tossed about in the public space can have an unpredictable effect on people. And I, I'm sure it exists, but that's not the, the primary reason that people commit murder. Right? The primary reason that you have genocides in the world, the primary reason that you have you know, mass slaughter is because of a compelling, dramatic conflict of interests between two groups who you know, live next to each other, right near each other. And there's a vital competition and you know, at least one group feels like uh, they're in a fight to the death. So the stochastic, you know, terrorism argument is essentially that, you know, people are just born yesterday, they're incredibly naive, and they're, you know, relatively easy to manipulate. But that's not the primary reason why people commit mass slaughter, right? The primary reason for genocide, the primary reason for mass slaughter is dramatic conflict of interest, whereby you feel like your people's survival is at stake, right? It's not because of hateful language, right? All societies are filled with hateful language, but mass genocide is relatively rare, right? There's hateful language in the Bible. There's hateful language in every civilization, in every society. There's tons of hateful language. Most people don't go out and act on the hateful language, right? They tend to only act on it when there's a pressing matter and they feel like their people's survival is at stake. So simple ideas such as we did not evolve to be gullible help you navigate through a whole lot of windy rhetoric about stochastic terrorism. I have no problem with that term. I do think there's a risk that people over apply it anytime that there's strong rhetoric that they don't like. However, the risk is real, but I, I, I wish people applied it consistently because I think exactly what you're saying that like people can easily understand if they're left wing, they can easily understand the issue with people promoting like derogatory hatred towards immigrants, talking about how they're infesting society, talking about how we need to protect our borders and our women from these people that are coming in and how you don't actually need to be saying, pick up your gun and go and kill people for that kind of rhetoric to have an effect when people go into mosques and murder Muslims or shoot, you know, immigrants in border areas or whatever, that it it has an impact, that ideology has an impact, even if you yourself are, you know, a figure doing that and then saying, no, of course, we don't want anyone to, to kill anyone, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm just saying Mexicans are rapists. I'm just, I'm not saying you should yeah, do about that. Yeah, they're not sending their best people, right? Yeah. But I do wish that people would apply that consistently because in the same regard, if you have an ideology which talks about a kind of clash of civilizations and a, a religion which is true, whereas others are a threat to the religion and that there is the particular word of God which you are promoting, right? And there are various interpretations of religions where you can be warriors for the faith and be rewarded for that, right? There's Buddhist concepts, there's Islamic concepts, there's Christian concepts about being warriors for your religion. Well, there's a time and a place to be a warrior for your people, all right? If you take up the sword 
in the wrong circumstance, then you're in all likelihood just going to make life worse for your people. If you take up the sword in the appropriate context, then you'll act, you know, as a protector of your people. Time and place, situation, events, my dear boy, events determine what is the adaptive path to choose. And now they can be interpreted metaphorically, but the point is, if you have that rhetoric, if you have rhetoric about martyrs being rewarded for doing their service for the, the religion and whatnot, in the same yeah. way, it can, it can be used to justify isolated acts or it can be used by extremists in, in a way to justify extreme interpretation. So... Yeah, I just, I just want stochastic terrorism to be a concept which is applied consistently whenever people are concerned about it. I'm not saying all, all ideologies are equally capable of motivating violence. I'm just saying that like it's notable that you know the people that are more concerned about Islamist stochastic terrorism are the kind that aren't wor worried about right-wing stochastic terrorism and vice, and vice versa. versa. probably. Yeah, I mean, that's, I guess I'm saying the same thing. Like, I agree with you about those, and I agree with Hitchens, I suppose, with those concerns about Islamic ideology providing that permission slip. I just look at the, look at the right-wing in Israel or look at contemporary Russia and ask whether or not you can see some religious ideological justification for similar kinds of things. And, you know, you can. And, and I guess I just, my frustration with Hitchens in, in this interview, which is I, I feel like if he's on solid ground speaking to the thing that he truly cares about, right, which is that he hates all religions, right? Mm. And he's in this debate talking about Islam in particular. And I, I just didn't feel like he made a convincing argument that there was something special about Islam that couldn't be attributed to particular historical, geographic and economic contingencies of the modern world. Mm. Mm. So I think we've spent enough time on Hitchens and Ramadan and their back and forth debates and whatnot. Maybe there's one quote that we can end on, which is a maybe a nice call where they agree. Let me just see. Did they do that? So, something nice and conciliatory, Chris. Let's, let's draw yeah, a line under this. It. You know, we've had this blast from the past. Nobody wants to talk about this stuff anymore. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, but I've, I'm not sure that I, that I can find a note that is appropriately conciliatory, but I, I can at least find Hitchens talking about the fact that they seem to both agree on the importance of pluralism and tolerance. And uh, no, Hitchens uses it to get a dig in, but nonetheless, here we are. Now, <laughs> you, you would do better, I think, Professor, if you identified yourself as a member of a very small and critical and endangered minority. Someone who really is against all this and will say so and will also decry the fact that the religion itself can't seem to throw it off. But you seem to have that a little bit both ways. Now, I'm going to have to well. stop you so we can get to Yes, so then my, my, my closing statement is this. If you want diversity as much as the professor does, as much as I'm sure many people here do, religious diversity, cultural diversity, um, what you need for it is this. You need a secular state with a godless constitution like this one. <laughs> Nick drop. So much of our modern political system is a result of adaptations to the 30 years war in Germany in the 17th century. The 30 years war between Protestants and Catholics in, in Germany was just so disruptive, so deadly, so murderous that you had the, the growth of liberalism, which sought to take religion out of the political. It sought to you know, move away from an era where you know everything was was political and say uh, we're going to remove religion and we're going to turn over more and more governance to you know non-political expert authorities so we're going to try to remove religion from the political in many places like australia effectively for the past 40 years there's been a tacit agreement between the major parties to remove you know immigration from the political uh, we're going to in many places want to try to you know remove race from the political all sorts of hot button issues on which people, you know, organize themselves and are prepared to to kill, all right, is is trying to is being neutralized in the age of liberalism. And to to an extent this is an adaptive strategy, but in, in a different context it will be a maladaptive strategy. So in a relatively, you know, peaceful, benign era, you know, removing religion from the from the political, probably a, a great idea. But in other situations, all right, where Religion is a huge aid in adapting to a dangerous, difficult, challenging environment, then removing religion from the political is maladaptive. So it depends on the circumstance whether or not it's uh, more adaptive to have a, a secular liberal government or a theocratic government. So, yeah, right now I'd probably rather have a secular liberal government, but the secular liberal government can go to such you know, secular liberal extremes that uh, some version of a theocratic government might seem more appealing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. well, I, I think, you know, I can side up on, on that. Like, I don't want to live under a theocracy, uh, no. be it Jonathan Pajot's Christian theocracy or an Islamist theocracy. <laughs> They're yeah. all theocracies. None of them are appealing to me. Or an Irish... 
I, I think after the United States Supreme Court in the Oberfell ruling effectively made gay marriage the, the law of the land, you know, increasing number of traditionalists and, and Christians started being tempted more in the Christian nationalist tradition. They started saying we, we need an alternative to our current secular liberal type of, of government. So when you try to reorder human nature and reorder the way that people have traditionally conducted themselves, built families and built communities, all right, at a certain point, there's going to be backlash to that. So we've never had, you know, same-sex marriage before in human history until the last 15 years, right? The Talmud, for example, is filled with criticisms of the Romans, but there is one passage where the Romans are praised for three things, and one of them is that they don't marry men with men. So even though homosexuality was tolerated or celebrated in hundreds of different cultures and civilizations, he did not have same-sex marriage till about 15 years ago. So for many people with particularly a traditional orientation on life, this radical new way of organizing families is anathema. And they start looking at you know, the, the secular liberal approach to life and thinking maybe there's a better way. Catholic theocracy, for that matter, you know, so, so yes, there we agree. Secularism, at least in terms of the government structure, it's good. seems to be, it's good. Yeah, yeah it's doing right. all right. Yeah, politically, <laughs> politically, I'm in favor of debonair, cosmopolitans, you know, knocking back a whiskey. Or not, it's fine if you don't want to drink. But if you, know. you, if you want to live under a religious theocracy, I have no issue with that. I just don't want to be there with you. <laughs> you if you go live at a religious theocracy, and I will stay in a secular democracy. So courses for courses, courses for courses. But yeah, yeah. So Fair enough. that's that's an excellent take, Chris. Well, right now, I don't see any religious theocracy that I would like to live under. So right now, places where I would like to live have secular liberal types of government. That's a good thing to answer. Yeah, yeah, for, for a secular person to hold. But, um, but anyway, but there, what we should do, Chris, I mean, we inserted ourselves into this debate. We couldn't resist. Our old new atheist stripes reared their ugly hackles and we, we got involved. But what are your thoughts about Hitchens more generally? Is he a guru? Does he make the barometer go ping? What's the deal? Yes, yeah, I think he is a traditional secular guru in the sense of somebody offering a worldview and having revolutionary theories that he promotes. A charismatic personality attracts followers and whatnot. But... He was at his peak before the social media age, before the you know the online ecosystems had properly fully developed. I think, and as a result of that, it's hard to say how he would have turned out overall. Because you know when he died, essentially, although he had a following and you know was a kind of iconic figure in, in various regards, he's very much you know a traditional media pundit type. Mm-hmm. But well, I did go to one party with Martin Amos and Christopher Hitchens. It was a party thrown by the Atlantic in Westwood around uh, 2004. I remember I started talking to this uh, very attractive, charming daughter of a billionaire at that party, is one of those very rare social gatherings that I've been to with uh, Kathy Sipe, where e- even Kathy Sipe, the formidably intelligent Kathy Sipe, the, the late uh, critic of the Los Angeles Times, even she was intimidated. I mean, there was a very high class of, of people. I didn't speak to Christopher Hitchens and Martin Amos at the party, but there are about uh, 100, 200 people there, and yeah, pretty pretty big crowd surrounding uh, Christopher Hitchens and Martin Amos. I got to speak to the literary editor of The Atlantic, I think Benjamin Schwartz. I talked to him about Tom Wolfe's novel, A Man in Fall. He didn't think uh, much of it. I I thought it was a great novel. I didn't uh, bother him with my opinions. I I was much more interested in uh, his perspective. But yeah, there are parties filled with brilliant, accomplished, uh, charismatic figures like uh, Christian, Christopher Hitchens or uh, Martin Amos. Here's a World War II training film. Don't relax that caution now. The Nazi party may be gone. The Nazi thinking, Nazi training, and Nazi trickery remain. The German lust for conquest is not dead. It's merely gone undercover. Somewhere in this Germany are the SS guards, the Schutzstaffel. Gestapo gangsters. Out of uniform, you won't know them, but they'll know you. Somewhere in this Germany are stormtroopers by the thousands. Out of sight, part of the mob, but still watching you and hating you. Somewhere in this Germany, there are two million. So not only occupying powers tend to have non-fraternization policies, but you know, most workplaces, most businesses also have 
non-fraternization policies. Ex-Nazi officials, out of power, but still in there, and thinking, thinking about next time. Remember that only yesterday, every business, every profession was part of Hitler's system. The doctors, technicians, clockmakers, postmen, farmers, housekeepers, toy makers, barbers, cooks, dock workers. Practically every German was part of the Nazi network. Guard particularly against this group. These are the most dangerous. German youth. Children, when the Nazi party came into power, they know no other system than the one that poisoned their minds. They are soaked in it. Trained to win by cheating. Trained to pick on the weak. They've heard no free speech. So, a comment in the chat, is there gay marriage in Australia? Yes, I think there's gay marriage in, what, every first world country two exceptions that come to mind. I don't think Japan has it, and Israel does not have it. Read no free press. They were brought up on straight propaganda, products of the worst educational crime in the entire... So propaganda didn't change the Germans, right? The type of people who supported the Nazi party were people who were aligned with the Nazi party's orientation on life or who wanted to get ahead and... You know, just found it, it facilitated their rise in society if they aligned themselves with the, the winning team. But those Germans who were completely opposed to Nazi ideology <clears throat> were not uh, convinced by propaganda. And that's the lesson from all authoritarian regimes, right? From Soviet Union to Nazi Germany to Mao's China. Uh, the propaganda of these regimes did not change many minds. Our history of the world. Practically everything you believe in they have been trained to hate and destroy. They believe they were born to be masters, that we are inferiors, designed to be their slaves. They may deny it now, but they believe it, and will try to prove it again. Don't argue with them. Don't try to change their point of view. Other allied representatives will concern themselves with that. So it's really a good idea to argue with anyone unless it, it's a hobby such as you're doing a live stream or you're, you're participating in a public debate. But uh, you can almost never change anyone's mind. It's simply not worth the aggravation, the hassle, and the blowback that you get when you try to correct people. You are so, for example, as Elliot Black phoned into the show the other day and he said that one of his criteria for friendship is that a uh, friend must have, have your back. And I was saying I never considered that a criteria for for friendship and for example i would not want you to try to you know argue uh, on on my behalf in, in general it, it's pointless if someone thinks i'm a terrible person it, you're not going to convince them by saying ah oh, 40 he's not so bad you're not being sent into germany as educators you are soldiers on guard you will observe their local laws respect their customs and religion and you will respect their property rights you will not ridicule them you will not argue with them. You will not be friendly. You will be aloof, watchful, and suspicious. Every German is a potential source of trouble. Therefore, there must be no fraternization with any of the German people. Fraternization means making friends. The German people are not our friends. You will and then when the Cold War heated up, suddenly the German people became our friends. So why do people who are enemies one moment become your friends the next moment? Because the situation has changed. Because of events, dear boy, events. When we needed the Germans, when we needed the Japanese, right? When we needed these countries as the Cold War increased in intensity, right? These people who were once declared our enemies, you know, were pulled to our bosom and became our friends. So there are no permanent friends nor enemies in life. There are just interests. We all have interests, and our interests you know, will change depending on the circumstance. Not associate with German men, women, or children. You will not associate with them on familiar terms, either in public or in private. 
You will not visit in their homes, nor will you ever take them into your confidence. And this is also true for highly identifying in-groups, right? It will depend, right? There are certainly strongly identifying Christian in-groups who don't have this out-group antipathy. But generally speaking, strongly identifying in-groups have this kind of antipathy to out-groups. However friendly, however sorry, however sick of the Nazi party they may seem, they cannot come back into the civilized fold just by sticking out their hand and saying, I'm sorry. Sorry. Not sorry they caused the war. They're only sorry they lost it. <laughs> okay, that was that was fun. I want to uh, play just a little bit more here from Decoding the Gurus. Would Hitchens be like, had he have lived till now with Twitter in, in COVID with Jordan Peterson and, and the intellectual dark web and, and so on? I can't quite imagine it. And I can see it going the way that he becomes completely a, a secular guru of the, the toxic variety or that indeed he doesn't at all. And he remains much more aloof and critical of that whole you know ecosystem. I can't say where he would land, but in this material, I will say that I think it's a good illustration of how eloquent he was, how rhetorically forceful he was, and also how there was substance behind his, his positions, but that he did take his positions often to a, you know, a particularly strong position or polemical point of view. And as a result, nuance is sometimes lost. And Yeah, generally speaking, I don't really care for polemics or for polemicists. Right? Polemics means you're, you're just you know, arguing for rhetorical effect. At his uh, burst from latest uh, Decoding the Gurus. I have to practice my mid-Atlantic accent. I'm sure I could do a pretty good one. I just need to hear a few more examples to get into the zone. Yeah, I think that's that's doable for you. I think that's within your range. I, I could see you as a mid-Atlantic radio DJ. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could do it. So the, the classic American accent is known as the mid-Atlantic accent, but it's it's largely died out. It used to be the dominant voice on radio and TV in America. I could do it. Yeah, so uh, so we get into a new format to have a little bit of a look around the Eurosphere, see what's been going on, keep tabs on some of mm. the old favorites. A bit like uh, one of the classic rock bands from the 1970s. We, we play some of the greatest hits as well as our new stuff. What have I've, you got for us, Chris? Well, Elon Musk announced a new Twitter CEO, and it's been enjoyable to observe because she appears to be a relatively, I, I stress relatively, normy advertising executive kind of type, right? So the kind of person that you would expect to get a CEO role for a tech company that wants to attract advertisers. And this led to much wheeling and gnashing of teeth amongst Elon Musk's pilled fans because she has some involvement with the World Economic Forum, Young Leaders Program or whatever. Like she she took part in something to do with the World Economics Forum. And right. So just because someone partakes in the World Economic Forum, it doesn't mean that they're you know bad, that they're necessarily against your interests. Right. That's the type of thing that uh, elites in media tend to do. As a result, they are all convinced that she's going to bring in the new world order and destroy Elon's palace of free speech. So it's been funny to see him get dogpiled by his brain minions. I know. And the beautiful part about it is that Elon Musk famously changed the algorithm on Twitter so as to boost the blue checks. So of course, he removed the actual identity verification for being a blue check. So it's no longer its original purpose of verifying the identity of people. Rather, it indicates that you're prepared to pay 10 bucks a month or 20 bucks, whatever it is to Elon Musk. And then, and so a lot of verified accounts like New York Times or whatever chose not to do that. So we're now unverified. The people who are verified were the uh, Twitter fanboys like Cat Turd 2 and the reams of Twitter trolls and weirdo people that like Elon. And the beautiful part is, I think there's lots to criticize Elon Musk for, but I think uh, Twitter is considerably improved and a much freer space since he took it over. Is that now all of Elon Musk's tweets, which normally if you looked underneath them, you'd see, I don't know, in scare quotes, respectable, large accounts replying. Instead, all you see is an endless stream of conspiracy wackadoodles with their $10 blue checks ranting at Elon Musk for bowing to the globalist conspiracies. Yeah, so that's been fun to observe. Oh, Chris, it's... Chris, Chris, before you say that, I have to say, I mean, you could almost um, say that uh, Elon Musk was hoist by his own catbird. Oh, uh-huh, wow. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was worth the weird. <laughs> but, yeah, no, well, the, it's, been, it's interesting in these kind of things because there's always like a sycophant versus conspiracist battle where the people who've been elevated by Elon Musk's attention are divided on whether they should send for him or whether it's time to call out the emperor 
has no clothes and isn't conspiratorial enough. And you see some people defending the pick and other ones like laying in Elon, but he'll never be able to satisfy them. Yeah, like uh, Donald Trump, Elon Musk seems incredibly petty. And many of the people that we have to interact with are incredibly petty. And so if you tick off, you know, Elon Musk, you, you might you know, well have fear for the, the safety of your Twitter account. And that's, that's how the world works, right? Uh, people tend to be very petty, small-minded. And it is, I don't think this is going to be anything that brings him down or stops him engaging with conspiracists or whatever, but it's just him getting a taste of the kind of community that he's encouraging. But Yeah, so we almost all do this, all right? We all tend to attract a certain kind of people to us, and we all tend to exert some influence over other people. And so... I'm thinking about a caller from last week who who complained about this, you know, endless stream of, you know, unsatisfying interactions with with other people. Well, we have a role to play, right? We have an effect on how other people interact with us. And so we can create a show or just in our daily life, the way that we speak and conduct ourselves, we're going to encourage a certain type of people to us. And if they are a pain in the neck, right, we probably played a role in that, right? There's probably... The trouble in us that is attracting troubled souls into our life. But in terms of the gurus, so of course they had a variety of takes on this, but I think perhaps the champion take was offered by Eric Weinstein, who responded by saying, I was hoping for Yonmi Park, Melissa Chan, Barry Weiss, etc. for Twitter CEO. With so many great women in the fight against fraud control, what are we doing here? I'm distracted by travel. Can someone catch me up as to what went into the new choice? I know nothing about her. Praying hands, symbol. So, mm. Youngmi Park, the North <laughs> Korean defector who has very many credible accusations of exaggerating and misrepresenting her tale of escaping North Korea and, and conditions there. Not to say that conditions in North Korea are good, but just that she does not seem to be a particularly reliable witness for the, the stuff there. And then Melissa Chan and Barry Weiss, you know, right-wing commentators. One could say this is Eric Weinstein perhaps flexing his own simp muscle in a particular direction for this selection of accounts to suggest. But I mean, he, he, actually, I've seen a lot of people poking fun at this, just saying this is an illustration of how credible people like Eric Weinstein are, how seriously we should take them. And I agree that that is an illustration of how deep and thoughtful Eric's mind is on these mm. kind of topics. Like it just makes no sense to appoint an SKP from North Korea or all the other people he mentioned, just who are just random. Substackers or conservative sub journalists. As the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company, that's not how the world works. So it does illustrate how Eric's brain works. I think it's primarily just simping. Frankly. Yeah, and, and also that thing about, you know, oh, I don't know anything about it. Can people catch me up? Like, obviously, he's got wind that there's the WEF conspiracies and stuff. So Eric cannot, it's, it's, yeah. he, he can never it's, just say that that's his concern or he wants to paddle in the conspiratorial pool. So he has to just invite people. Oh, I, I know nothing. You know, is there some controversy around her? What, what's the issue, right? Like, uh, yeah, he's, he's manipulative, but it's, it's so transparent. It's like being, it's like being tricked by a 12 year old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, it's so transparent and it, it illustrates his, his worldview, which is that like him and the people that he knows, his friends, you know, the, yeah. the good people, this, this inner circle of people are the people that ought to be running things. It's just it's instead of the reality, like which is that you are like us and like most normal people, rando <laughs> people on the internet. That's all he is and all we are for that matter. But just the self-aggrandizement is so annoying. I know. Well, speaking of people with uncharacteristically youthful mindsets, I'm going to also play some clips from a recent Lex Friedman episode because you know we we covered lex and he's cropped up on various occasions but i i feel like these clips illustrate some aspects of why lex okay very disturbing murder of a you know attractive blonde jogger in arizona that's we're just nervous to be out by ourselves right now we also know that this dark period we'll have her memories and, and we will love her so I almost never feel physically unsafe. Certainly when I'm in Australia, I almost never feel physically unsafe. But women being the physically weaker sex, right? The normal woman, particularly in, in a big city, is going to feel unsafe many, many times a day. And just uh, horrifying what happened to this jogger. For every minute that we are on this earth. I know that Phoenix residents are resting easier after this arrest. Her life cut short. Her accused killer 
it seems no stranger to a jail cell. It's been exactly one week since the murder of Lauren Heike, and we are now learning more about what's been described as a random attack. Police say the 29-year-old was stabbed 15 times while hiking on a North Phoenix trail. That suspect, a convicted felon, was arrested days later. ABC 15's Ashley Paredes walks us through what led up. We, we get to decide the, the amount of violent crime we have in our society. Right, this killer, if he'd been put away for his heinous behavior prior to this murder, right, this wouldn't have happened. Right, if we simply lock up the super predators, right, the less than one percent of our population who are most likely to commit these kind of crimes, right, someone who commits a violent crime, if you just lock them up for a long, long time, you can dramatically reduce your murder and mayhem rates. To his arrest. Heartbreak felt across the community as new details emerged in the murder of 29 year old Lauren Heike on a hiking trail in North Phoenix. Seeming so I remember talking to women when I describe my hikes that, that I go on. They'd often say, You're lucky you're a man. Like, I would not feel safe you know, doing what you're doing. They wouldn't feel safe, you know, hiking alone. And my reaction, I'm not sure I said it out loud, was, You know, that's silly. <laughs> you're silly. But then you see stories like this. And, and perhaps this uh, female reaction against hiking alone has more justification. Mingly at random. It's uh, scary to learn the mind of someone like this um, and what he was thinking. 22-year-old Zion Teasley appearing before a judge Friday. A Maricopa County prosecutor says DNA, cell phone, and circumstantial evidence all helped in connecting him to the crime. Police believe Heike was killed on April 28th, giving us a timeline of her steps that morning. We're told surveillance video collected from the area shows Heike at 10.29 a.m., leaving the entrance of her apartment complex on Mayo Boulevard. At 10.38 a.m., Lauren was seen on video walking southbound on Allied Way taking a right turn on Princess Drive. Little did she know that around that same time, Teasley was coincidentally just right across the intersection. That is when their paths crossed, and police say he continued following her to a trail entrance about a quarter mile away. According to court documents, at 10.52 a.m., a surveillance camera from a home within the Paradise Ridge community shows Lauren walking alone on the trail before stepping out of view. Nearly 30 seconds later, Teasley is seen walking the same direction. Then a short time later, he is seen sprinting. By 10.55 a.m., Teasley is trying to cross a barbed wire fence along the trail, which leads to a desert area. Detectives believe Lauren ran through there, trying to escape Teasley, her shoe left behind. She was found 24 hours later with 15 stab wounds from a pocket knife. I, I believe she fought him off. She was able to get away, but her injuries were too severe and she just couldn't continue. Teasley is being held on first degree murder and for violating his probation. He was released from prison last November after being convicted of armed robbery, robbery and disorderly conduct stemming from multiple incidents in 2020. Author okay, any judge who would have released this guy ha has blood on his hands. Authorities also say Teasley was recently terminated from his employer for being, quote, aggressive toward female employees. Documents state Teasley told investigators he was struggling with his sexuality. And when shown a picture of Lauren, he said he recognized her from the news and wanted to look like her. May her memory be a blessing for you. She was taken from us too soon. We cannot. So uh, Steve Saylor asked if we're going to see uh, a rise in these widow sex crimes right this guy wanting to look like her whoa so steve Saylor says this sounds like a 1970s crime the kind of crime that would draw interest from movie and tv screenwriters of the time but in adapting the true crime story of course they dropped the fact that the killer was part black i'd assume that historical causality flows in both directions as more bizarre sex crimes are perpetrated you get more movies and journalistic coverage about bizarre sex crimes and then as more movies and coverage of sex crimes is made you get more sickos visualizing themselves doing something serious uh, similar so through the 60s 70s into the 80s right there was this uh, big surge in weird sex crimes and serial killings perhaps that had to do with the loosening of morals to the do what thou wilt notions that emerged from the late 1960s doesn't that come from one of the leading satanist thinkers so maybe something's going on again in the 2020s. Our culture, theoretically at least, worships the transgressive. 
On the other hand, young people today appear to be a lot less controversial, audacious, outgoing, and energetic. In the 1960s, you've got porn to every taste, vastly more available. So perhaps there's less urge to do it yourself. Life is much more virtual now. And transgressiveness is supposed to manifest more in identity than behavior. So perhaps the 1960s were the age of do what do what thou wilt, while the 2020s are becoming the age of uh, don't bother doing what thou ought, such as putting on a seatbelt or treating, treating the uh, police with uh, respect. Another disturbing story out of uh, New York, where this pregnant physician assistant, right, is, you know, being called a Karen because she cries for help when after she has paid for a bike, you know, this, this gang of, of youths surround and make fun of her. The roughly two-minute video starts with a white woman wearing hospital scrubs straddling a city bike, screaming for help, even though she doesn't appear to be in danger. Please help me! This is not your bike, repeats the young black... Okay, this is her bike. She did pay for the bike. I right, imagine you paid for something and then someone else comes along and says, hey, this is not yours. And, and you know, a group of outgroup youths surround you and mock you. Man standing next to her who says he just rented that city bike. His friends standing around him. Right, this is my bike. It's on my account. Yes, please get off. While the video doesn't show the young man touching her, it does show her remove her hospital badge, then grab the young man's phone. Oh, why you took his phone? The woman then tells him he's hurting her fetus. I Okay, so that's a bad idea, right? Don't grab strangers, don't grab their property. When a man, also in scrubs, inquires what's wrong, the woman all of a sudden appears to begin sobbing. When the man tells the woman to choose another bike, she calmly removes herself. Another young man recording the video can be heard saying, well, How you stop crying? Not a, not a tear came down, miss. We do not know what happened before the recording began at this city bike stand near East 30th and 1st Avenue. But many are blasting the hospital worker, a physician's assistant who NYC Health and Hospital... Okay, they're blasting her. She's a, a pregnant woman who paid for a bike and then someone else commandeers it and mocks her. Bellevue say appears to work for them. The city hospital group saying they are sorry this happened and are reviewing the incident. Civil rights attorney Ben Crump tweeting, this is unacceptable, and she grossly tried to weaponize. All right, she wasn't stealing a city bike. She was on a bike that she had paid for. Her tears to paint this man as a threat. This is exactly the type of behavior that has endangered so many black men in the past. No one answered at the woman's Brooklyn apartment or returned our calls for comment. This woman lives in her building. That woman lives in this building with me? Another neighbor who knows the woman in the video told us off camera he believes the incident is being blown out of proportion. But this neighbor says the young men could have ended up in jail or worse. It's clearly like a Karen, a Central Park. Welcome to the Ferris Show on television. First tonight, the importance of fairness and telling both sides of a story that includes not rushing to judgment, as it now appears some of the biggest names in media did this week. For example, the New York Post branded Sarah Comrie city bike Karen after an altercation with her and a group of teens went viral. Other outlets branded Sarah everything but a bedsheet wearing racist over the video. But as we told you last night, there is a lot a lot more to this story, and to be fair, we think you should know. Sarah had just ended her 12-hour shift at Bellevue Hospital as a physician assistant. She is six months pregnant. And here is the kicker. Her lawyer provided us these receipts showing she had rented the bike in question. In fact, the bike number on the receipt actually matches the bike she is seen being pushed off of in the video. Again, these are facts, not a... Right, you pay for a bike and then you're surrounded by strangers, youths, who push you off the bike that you paid for and they mock you. Opinions or rushes to judgment from an internet video. Sarah's lawyer is with us, Justin Marino. Uh, appreciate okay, disturbing, disturbing interaction there in, in New York. So... I'm a big reader, regular reader of a Thomas Edsall column. He's a weekly columnist in the New York Times. And 
his latest work on May 17th, America has become both more and less dangerous since Black Lives Matter. So this is how Steve Saylor describes him. A public-spirited old-timer quietly drops some bombshells in a manner intended to bore sensitive New York Times subscribers into not noticing that Black Lives Matter has gotten more black lives murdered than saved. So Black Lives Matter during the Ferguson effect era has gotten 15 times as many people killed as it has saved. It's just uh, devastated America, particularly certain black communities had an astronomical increase in bad behavior, including violent crime. So when America went insane over George Floyd, right, George Floyd's black life was chosen to matter more than those of, say, some random black child who gets killed by a stray bullet, fired because blacks and other groups started carrying more illegal handguns because cops have retreated to the donut shop after 20, May 25, 2020, responding to incentives that they're the bad guys. So the number of civilians shot dead by police has been pretty stable over the last decade. Right, Civilian bad behavior has gone up a great deal since Black Lives Matter, since the Ferguson effect in 2014, but the police have become less shooty relative to provocations due to Black Lives Matter as a result of police backing off, right? Fatal police shootings are stable around a thousand a year, but you've had this dramatic escalation in overall homicide deaths. So perhaps the media should be trained to avoid stoking unnecessary murders, such as the many thousands of unnecessary murders that we've had over the last nine years since Ferguson. Okay, let me catch my breath here. If it's if it's unchecked, is we die from it, we end up in an institution, we end up in jail, we end up losing everything that's near and dear and important to us. So if we go back to self-esteem, and we're using Dr. Nathaniel Brandon's model, the six pillars of self-esteem, which we really actually... He said there's seven pillars. So we're going to start talking about his seven pillars of self-esteem and just a reminder of what those are. And then let's look at what's happening in this step in relationship to these pillars. The first was living life consciously. Well, that means seeing life as it is, being aware of what is happening for us. Does this step help us move in that direction? Of course it does. So it's a big yes. That's part of the therapeutic value of this step. We're starting already with step one to build a healthier self-esteem, a self-esteem that's aligned with reality, a self-esteem that's based on humility of accepting ourselves as we are, not as we'd like to be. Now, remember, step one also has to do with the unmanageability. So it's really addressing both of those components. The second pillar is self-acceptance. Wow, that is so important in terms of the dynamic that's going on with this. We've been talking about that now for the last several weeks. I'm going to continue the discussion of that tonight even though some of these other pillars are also being activated with this step. The third is self-assertiveness. Well, I don't see that as, as, as relevant to this step. The fourth one, oh, I'm sorry, the third one is self-responsibility. Clearly, that's highly relevant to what's going on. We are now taking responsibility for our life. We're taking responsibility for our relationship with what's going on. Very, very important aspect of, of self-esteem, very important aspect of emotional sobriety. The fourth one is self-assertiveness. I don't see that being activated much in this step living purposefully neither is that yet that will come into play later in my opinion our personal integrity that is number five and of course as we start to so over the past uh, two or three weeks i've been listening to about 30 minutes of uh, this guy uh, every day i just find it calms me down centers me this is alan berger a psychologist he's got a youtube channel called optimal recovery and emotional sobriety institute to deal with and accept ourselves as we are, that is a movement towards more integrity, towards being more whole. Even though I'm admitting a limitation, that's my limitation. That's making me more of who I am. And that's what integrity is about. So this guy apparently sober from alcoholism for more than 40 years. He might have some wisdom. About wholeness. Um, Oh, and then number seven, I guess I screwed up. So living purposely was number one, two, three, four, five. Number six is living with personal integrity. And number seven is willingness, right? The willingness to practice these principles, these ideas in our life. Well, this becomes an important thing. And that's what we start to learn. We start to see the power of paradox here. And that by accepting who we are, what we're doing, how we're doing it, then we begin to create the possibility of change. Right. So I just need to calm down. It's so easy when you're live streaming to get out of alignment, right? Lose your integrity, become overexcited, overimpulsive, 
overly dark, overly histrionic, grandiose, uh, abusive. All right, so just a little bit there of Alan Berger calms me right down. Okay, let's talk about the YouTube redemption arc. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? We are back with another DSP video. And today, DSP gets asked about his redemption arc. So as you know, Boogie and Wings are trying to get their redemption arc going with through Keemstar. And Phil gets asked about his. And he starts talking about how he doesn't need a redemption arc because he never fell from grace. That's right. It's one of the... Come on, we're all sinners. We've all fallen from grace. Those days, one of those rants. Get ready for a huge, huge projection. It's Phil being Phil. You know the drill. Sit back, grab some to eat, grab some to drink, and watch Phil being Phil. See, this is funny. Two Tuck Tuckerson says, Do you see a redemption arc being possible for you? If so, what do you think has to happen? Here's the thing. For a redemption arc to happen, okay, someone had to have had fallen okay i was popular like over 10 years ago at a time when youtube was into it this is painful because this guy sounds like me at my most uh, defensive and pompous i mean when someone shares the truth right when someone speaks the truth you feel it. it's like the, the molecules of the air change this doesn't quite feel real now the, the genre of live stream, you know, requires that you be willing to cop, you know, a ton of abuse. You know, you often become a receptacle for people's rage for, you know, absolutely no apparent reason whatsoever. I, I think his conversation here and when I get like this, right, it's more powerful when you disclose and connect rather than when you're defensive, right? If you were a little more vulnerable here rather than pretending to be invulnerable, right? We're all incredibly vulnerable, right? You know, some genetic defect could go off in my system and I could never live stream again or I could never walk again, right? Our lives can be ruined at any moment and you're very likely to forever ruin your life if you're doing a show like this, all right? If you're opining on controversial events, you know, live over the internet, all right? It's a high wire act, very likely to make a complete ass of yourself at any moment due to the perils of the e-personality. So let's get a little bit more here a certain kind of content then i basically became the whipping boy through memes and this is how you don't play for a decade or more but i still make content for an audience that likes me there's a lot of idiots who don't like me but that doesn't mean that i fell from grace i never had the grace to begin with i was never a virally popular person that when you're talking about redemption art you look at someone who literally everyone is crapping on on the internet but they're not getting any positivity they're not getting any kind of love they're barely scraping by, and then all of a sudden, something turns around for them, and now everyone likes them. How is that going to happen for me? Okay, so it's intoxicating when you put something out publicly and people respond uh, positively, right? It's such a gigantic hit that it can completely, you know, turn you and hook you into all sorts of destructive behavior. But the more sober and balanced and centered and aligned you are, the more you have something going on in your real world, the less likely you are to become... So intoxicated by getting some applause online that you start chasing it. For me, the only way, again, that would happen is for me to completely change who I am. The kind of content I make, I'm literally never going to be popular. You understand? YouTube video consumption is not for the kind of content I put out. It's not. They want drama. They want crazy stunts. They want stupid behavior. They want, you know what I'm saying? They want clown jokes. They want dumb shit. That's what's popular on YouTube. Okay, so what type of people become successful on YouTube or on TV or from from the pulpit, right? They're people who seem to validate you, right? They seem to recognize your pain. So I remember when my life fell apart with chronic fatigue syndrome at age 21, and I was like sleeping in the bushes outside of UCLA, and then I'd call into Dennis Prager's radio show. Like I felt like he really empathize with my pain like it was just so calming to talk to him i felt you know understood like his voice his manner you know kind of showed that he felt my pain and it you know it just made me love him because you know people like dennis prager and the effective youtuber and the effective pundit and the effective guru 
right? They have the ability to get on the same page with you, right? To build this shared reality. And uh, bringing up hate facts, right, can, can blow up that shared reality. Uh, so I remember I broke my wrist in something like April of 1998. And I was feeling fairly isolated at the time. So I, I walked to the hospital in, in Century City to have the surgery. And then coming out of surgery, the nurse gave me coffee. And I never drank coffee at that time. So it may have contributed to me having a panic attack. And they kept me in the hospital overnight, which they were not expecting to do. And then they didn't want to release me because I didn't have someone to come pick me up because uh, I was just feeling so isolated. And I finally you know, got out about noon the next day, took a taxi ride home and uh, went to the pharmacist to fill a, a pain prescription, which I never ended up using. And while I was waiting in line, this gypsy tapped me on the shoulder and said, oh, I'm getting a special feeling about you. You should come see me. So after I filled my prescription, I went to see her. I think I spent $20 on you know, one of her gypsy consultations. And she asked me what I most wanted. <laughs> I said what I most wanted was to hear from Dennis Prager. So this is about five months into my against Dennis Prager's wishes, against the wishes of all my friends that I had in common with Dennis Prager in Los Angeles. You know, I was writing on a near daily basis about his radio show, and sometimes I'd write critically. And I confided to the gypsy, you know, what I most want is to hear from Dennis Prager. And I think she sold me a, a crystal that I could take home and, and put under my pillow. And so I get home from the gypsy, fire up my computer, and for the one and only time in my life, I remember I received an unsolicited email from, from Dennis Prager. I guess I need to back up. Before I, I'd gone to fill the prescription, I'd made a post online about how you know, coming out of surgery uh, and then getting home, listening to Dennis Prager on the radio was a, a tremendous source of comfort for me because you know I felt like Dennis Prager you know, understood me, understood what I'd been through, and he was a man of kindness and goodness and and, and empathy, and it was just so comforting to hear him. And so Dennis Prager sent me an email quoting back what I had written, and then he said, I hope you remember that the next time, for whatever reason, you want to hurt me. Now, if I wrote something uh, critical about Dennis Prager then, or now, I, I didn't think of it in terms of, you know, hurting, not hurting him. I was critiquing the public words of a public figure. But it does seem like Donald Trump, many public figures tend to take things, you know, awfully personally. <laughs> and I believe that, oh my God, maybe there's something to this gypsy woman. And, you know, that, that dynamic, you know, maybe the crystal and the reading, like, you know, maybe she's going to help me restore my, my broken relationship with, with Dennis Prager. But uh, one thing that can really blow up a relationship is the use of hate facts, right? You can have hate facts about individuals, uh, hate facts that, you know, things are just socially, communally, or individually unacceptable, and you bring them up at, you know, in opportune times and places, and they can, you know, blow up your relationships, and then you have to decide, you know, what's more important to you? Is it being able to speak your mind publicly, which is how I've usually cited that's the, that's the side that I've usually fallen down in this dilemma. Or you can restrict the things that you say publicly to try to maintain your relationships. So it's so strengthening, invigorating, exciting when you create a shared reality with other people. You know, you build something together, you connect, you have empathy, you see where the other person's coming from, you, you develop a certain synchronicity in your interactions. But then the inopportune use of, of hate facts can completely blow that up. And even people who are public figures, right, even people who say disclose you know, painful things about themselves and their struggles you know, in their YouTube videos or in their blog posts or in a memoir, that doesn't mean these things are any less painful. That doesn't mean that uh, you can just you know, bring them up in, in a conversation and they're going to be really happy you know, at all times to revisit you know, painful things that they have confided over the public airways. To immature nonsense. I don't put out immature nonsense. So unless I completely changed who I was on YouTube to buy into the drama, I would never blow up on YouTube. 
Therefore, a redemption arc isn't possible because I don't want to be redeemed by these idiots. I don't want fucking morons and clowns watching my content because I change to be what they want to digest. I would rather make the meaningful content I like to make and I have enough support to keep making. You understand? Okay, like press 10 if this is exactly how I sound much of the time. And I press 5 if it's you know, somewhat how I sound. <laughs> and like press 1 if this is you know, rarely how I sound. Like I listen to this and I think, ouch, this guy sounds a lot like me. And it's kind of painful to listen to. <clears throat> That's the difference. That's what, what people don't understand. I can't believe he won't take the money or do this. You're right. You can't believe it because you have a closed mind. And you don't understand that I'm happy doing what I do and being who I am. I don't have to answer to anyone. I don't have to change who I am to be happy because I already am. The people who have these redemption arcs, they're miserable people. Oh, I hate who I am. I'm stuck in a rut. I got to do the same thing. That's not me. It's literally not me. I love coming here to streams and making this kind. So I, I think I love the redemption arc more than uh, most people because so often in my life, if I simply wanted to be rid of my unwanted self and i thought i could redeem myself by running marathons i thought i could redeem myself by reading a lot of history books i thought i could redeem myself by becoming a christian missionary to india i thought i could redeem myself by becoming a great journalist i thought i could redeem myself by anchoring the cbs evening news i thought i could redeem myself by being a sportscaster i thought i could redeem myself by sleeping with a lot of beautiful women I thought I could redeem myself by becoming you know, a popular blogger or, or, or vlogger. Uh, I thought I could redeem myself by studying the Alexander Technique. I thought I could redeem myself by converting to Judaism. I thought I could redeem myself by becoming an Orthodox Jew. I thought I could redeem myself by becoming an acolyte of Dennis Prager. I thought I could redeem myself by practicing you know, various types of, of yoga. There was one, uh, what was the... Happy, healthy, holy, 3H, uh, Kundalini Yoga. Yeah, I thought I could redeem myself through Kundalini Yoga. I thought I could redeem myself through cognitive behavioral therapy. I thought I could redeem myself through psychodynamic therapy. I thought I could redeem myself by reading, you know, any of like 500 books that I've read through. I thought I could redeem myself by becoming friends with so-and-so, by deepening my relationship with this community, by becoming an acolyte of, of this rabbi thought I could redeem myself by taking on this spiritual practice. I thought I could redeem myself by you know, making a, a daily practice of, of this or that, you know, self-help, you know, personal growth, uh, you know, insight from, from this or that uh, guru, right? Uh, and, and the type of uh, neurotic personality is just highly vulnerable to cults, highly vulnerable to gurus, highly vulnerable to you know, the search for personal transformation so I can, like, get rid of, you know, my unwanted self and, you know, be, be born again as a, you know, much, much better person. Content with you guys every single day. That's why I'm here. I wouldn't be here if I didn't enjoy it. I would find something else to do <clears throat> or I would absolutely bank and capitalize on the drama and the shit. I don't want to. I like who I am. I like the meaningful content I'm putting out, the, the curated content for a certain audience. You understand? Right. So I, I said uh, a couple of minutes ago, you know, tell me in the chat, you know, give me a 10 out of 10 if this is who I resemble much of the time or give me a 5 out of 10 or give me, you know, a 1 out of 10 if I'm not much like uh, this guy. So depending on, you know, how centered and balanced I am, you know, I have more or less need for that feedback. So as I've experienced life, up until approximately the last five or ten years, I've just been heavily, heavily dependent on other people telling me who I am and kind of unwilling to do the hard work of exercising my own judgment. So I'd like to think that age 56, I'm a little bit more capable of standing on my, on my own two feet, have a little less need for other people to tell me who I am. <clears throat> That's correct. Tuto Carlson says, I think Wings is now happy because he has a redemption arc. Wings literally sat on his streams every day saying he hated it. He hated his work. He hated his life. He, he was saying miserable things like this. That he was stuck in a rut doing things he didn't like. Now he likes what he's doing. Good for him.
That's the redemption arc. Someone who is at the bottom. And I remember one of the, the most common, I think the most telling critique of my memoir, like excommunicated rebel without a shawl, is that it lacked a redemption arc. Found a way to turn it around and now is on a positive momentum. That's called a redemption arc. There you go. I like what I do. So does my audience. Everyone else just needs to leave me the fuck alone and stop trying to change me into some corrupted individual I don't want to be. I'm happy being Dark Side Phil, the guy who's a small time rinky dink guy who has content for a small audience and we can have this personal interaction and a good time every day. You understand? Right. How many times can one honestly say, you know, I'm happy where I am before it starts sounding defensive? I think you can maybe say it like once a show, but once you have to keep repeating it, repeating it, it just doesn't feel authentic. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? We are back for another DSP video. Today, he's going to rage and rant against YouTube and their monetization plans. Oh my God, Phil, let it go. It's not 2010 anymore. Because he talks about how in the Wild West, he was making money and this and that, and there was a personal touch. But now, they're a business, and they have to look after advertisers. Are you that dumb, Phil? It's a business with advertisers they have to please. So they can't have things on, let's say, Coca-Cola on a terrorist video. like. And then he says, oh, just because some people do it, everyone should not be held to the same uh, accountability. They're doing it so nobody well, does it again, up. Phil. It's their platform. It's their TOS. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. And then he complains about his shorts not being monetized. He starts talking about uh, PewDiePie and the incident with the N-word. And then he talks about how YouTube is not allowing him to be him. And at that point, he starts talking about the Wild West of... Okay, people are really that interested in you being you, right? People want you to be that which they find pleasing. Uh, very few people are really agitating for your authenticity. ...of YouTube again. So at that point, he was, you know, or well, he still is, racist, sexist, homophobic. So, Phil, you're saying that you want to be that person again, even though you said you've changed? Phil, you are... You are such a silly goose, uh, but Phil, Phil never changes. So sit back, grab something to eat, grab something to drink, and listen to Phil being Phil. Let's talk a little bit about YouTube monetization and how it has changed over the last several years. YouTube uh, keep updating their policy when it comes to monetization, all right? There are many forms of uh, monetization, right? You can get uh, donations or you can just get likes or positive comments or can help you in the real world. You can build businesses. Right? It's not all about getting advertising against your videos. I, I dropped interest in that just too many restrictions uh, years ago. I, I'd rather just freely say what I want to say within the overall context of uh, YouTube's terms of service and do without the extra restrictions of being able to monetize ads. And how this has affected people making content on the site. <clears throat> okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Sorry about that. So let me tell you a little story. I've been a YouTuber for 15 years. Back in the day, when you had ads on your videos, it was the Wild West. Anything went. There was no regulation whatsoever. You could literally put out a video of you saying, Fart, 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 dick, mick, fuckle, fuck. And you could just say it for 10 minutes straight, and you could slap an ad on it, and it's fine. No one cares. Even if it's the most nonsensical garbage, you could make a video, and you get ads all over it, and no one would give a shit. Back in the day, we're talking like 2010, 2011, 2012, 2013. The ads on YouTube were running like, like the fucking river of milk and honey. The horn of plenty was exploding with revenue everywhere. It was insane. <clears throat> you can get, get ads on anything, and they all paid a ton. To give you some perspective on this, all right? On a new new release day, I would go to GameStop, and I would buy a new game. I would come home, and I would film a video that I called Release Day Unboxings. This was before I was even, like, a streamer. 
and I would just set up a camera and for 15 minutes I would say here's the new game let's look at the box here's what it says on the back let's open it let's open it oh here's the game if there was a booklet or whatever we look at that any packaging okay here's what I'm expecting from the game all right guys let's go play it 15 minute video the video would get let's say 20 to 30 thousand views okay because back then I was very popular on YouTube that video of 20 to 30 thousand views would make more money because of ad revenue than the game I bought you know okay uh interesting article in the messenger have you heard about uh the messenger some new outlet and it says that the best money republicans have ever spent on politics how conservatives are training their next leaders on college campuses so some of the best money conservatives are spending on politics is happening in places long viewed as bastions of liberal thought college campuses schools and universities have become hotbeds for the post-pandemic culture wars and we now have a thriving infrastructure of well-funded conservative news sites with names like campus reform and the college fix and we also have you know, more uh, youtube and, and social media sites right since the 2020 election like uh, sites like rumble and odyssey All right so we now have debates over how academics should teach gender identity critical race theory other sensitive topics so you have conservative sites publishing eye-catching stories like a recent scoop about a professor arguing luxury pantries have racist and sexist roots and then this is in turn picked up by media goliaths like fox and the new york post there's a long-term benefit to privately funded campus media which operates separately from college sponsored student newspapers is recruiting and training the next generation of conservative leaders and media stars so these outlets have mottos like america's leading site for college news have become a darling of big name republican donors like the devos family playing a raft of student journalists also happens to be far less expensive than funding politics uh, you don't change many names you know buying advertising this may very well be far more effective use of funds the three organizations primarily responsible for funding on campus conservative media spent roughly 15 million over five years to keep the publications afloat so if you believe that liberal media bias is a problem and it distorts everything then you'd want to you know, support things like uh like this so it looks like uh, conservatives getting some pretty big bang bang for the buck All right this is what uh, i was listening to this morning to uh, get uh, get centered um i want to take a moment and kind of review what's happened to us as we've worked the steps up to this point in time how have we changed at this moment now i've described the steps before is kind of following the arc of our own personal development you know, we come into this world in a very, very undifferentiated state. You know, we're two little, we're a, we're, we're a sperm and an egg that come together and start to create life. And that egg that, that is now fertilized starts to divide and which each division, it's differentiating into what we can be. And all of that's taking place within inside the mother's womb. We're completely dependent on our mom for. So differentiation means that if you're an artist, you know, you take time to paint. If you're a speaker, you take time to speak. If you excel at knitting you take time to to knit right you become who you are everything oxygen nourishment you know security um, safety everything we're 100 undifferentiated from her and the first act of differentiation is our birth and the first thing that we do when we differentiate other than coming through the birth canal which we all did or through a c-section but as soon as we come out into this environment now we need to start supporting ourselves and that's where the first breath of our life takes place now I'm inhaling and exhaling, so I'm providing myself with the oxygen I need to survive. I am now starting to support myself. I am now on this path of differentiating myself biologically. And as we've mentioned before, the biological differentiation is, is just something that's instinctual. It's just going to unfold. Nobody told you to walk. You wanted to walk because that's what you could do. That's what you wanted to do. You wanted to do what, you were, what was possible for you to develop that ability to become whole, to actualize yourself. Well, we also have that same drive on an emotional, you know, psychological and spiritual level. The problem is, is it's not instinctual in the way the biology is. The biology is hardwired. And for us to now differentiate into being what we can be, we need certain experiences. We need a certain kind of attachment that people write about all the time, a secure attachment. And they, there's, you know, tons of books out there about what happens when you don't get that. Bowlby was the first one to talk about all of this stuff. And we also need some emotional coaching. If the attachment is good, then the next thing that happens is we need someone to be able to teach us how, how to cope with our emotions, what kind of a relationship to have with ourselves. Well, our parents can only give us what they, what they have, which is never enough. 
And it goes to this whole idea that, that Theodore Isaac Rubin talked about in, in his book, Compassion and Self-Hate, is that we're victims of victims. So parents, no parent is feeling completely good about themselves. Everybody we know has a self-hating process and they teach us to hate ourselves. They teach us to construct a false self. They teach us to construct a despise self. And so now the world starts spinning around all these should demands. And if I'm this way or that way, I'll be okay. And so we create a, an incredible distance from who we are to become what we think we should be. So we actualize a concept of ourselves rather than actualizing ourselves. And we all do that to try to control what our experience is, to make sure that we're going to be loved, to make sure we're going to be accepted, and make sure we belong. My God, you know, what an order <laughs> to make sure that we're going to be accepted, belong, and, and to be loved. And, you know, we start to, to hatch this plan very early in life, and it continues to unfold as our cognitive processes develop and as we transform, you know, our cognitive Right. It's a wonderful thing to be loved and to connect, but are you willing to sell out your own integrity and your own value system to do it? On the other hand, are you so determined to live out your particular value system that you place no importance and no willingness to compromise to stay connected to the ones you love? Cognitive abilities and Piaget pointed all of that trans transformation that takes place in us cognitively. And it's, it's a wonderful study. But here we are now in our life, and most of us, I call that the trance. That's the trance we put ourselves in and that the culture puts us in, right? That we have to be what we think we should be to be okay. And a lot of times we don't realize that that's even a problem. We just dedicate our lives to it and it becomes our reality until something happens, some event happens in our life and we start to realize the personal limitations of the trajectory of our life. And that's when a lot of people come into recovery when they've hit this crisis and they realize that, look, what I, I've been asleep. My God, there's so much I don't know. There's so much I don't know about life. There's so much I don't know about what I need to take care of, do to take care of myself. And that is that is the, the wake up call that happens in step one in many ways. We start to wake up to the reality that we are not who we think we are, that life is not what we think it is. And that there's a whole new possibility that many of us could never have imagined. So this is how that worked out for, for me. I heard about step four, right? Before I'd even properly worked step one, step two, step three, I heard about step four. It kind of begins with making a list of your resentments. So I took my 12 step uh, program book to Starbucks and I read through the first three steps. And I got into step four and said, you know, make a list of everyone you resent. So I think at the top of my list of resentments were rabbis who'd asked me to, you know, stop attending their, their synagogue. And I think I had, you know, Dennis Prager on there because when I first met Dennis Prager in Tampa Bay in late January of 1994, he said if I moved to Los Angeles, he might have work for me. Then I moved to Los Angeles and he didn't have work for me. And so I felt, you know, let down and disappointed. And there may even be, you know, a little bit of uh, resentment in there. And then I, you know, listed uh, these two women who had, uh, cheated on me. And so I, I made a list of you know, probably 15 major resentments that I had in my life. And so I worked, worked vertically. And then I think the, the next, the next column or the next row was, uh, what part of myself was affected. And it turned out that the things that caused me to have the most resentment were those things that would lower me in other people's esteem, like anything that would, you know, lower my status right? Lower my standing in my community, right? Lower my standing in the eyes of women I was attracted to. That was the thing that was causing me the most resentment. And then there was a very painful column. What, what role did I play? And this is where I experienced a tremendous transformation. It's like, oh, wow, I played a huge role, a substantial role in, you know, all these incidents, all these interactions Right, I did not act in continence with the, the the values of the community or the values of the relationship that I was trying to uphold. So I had stepped on the feet of other people. They then retaliated against me. And when I had that realization, pretty much all my resentment just melted away. And to the best of my knowledge, it's never come back. You know, in intensity on an ongoing basis, just facing up to the substantial role that I had played in causing these negative interactions that how I had brought, you know, most of my own troubles on myself that I had harmed other people and then they had retaliated and I had not enjoyed that retaliation. So that was 
transformation that I experienced in something like May of, of 2012. And uh, I don't think it's ever, it, it's ever come back with that intensity. I don't know. Maybe I'm fooling myself. Maybe I'm just, you know, filled with resentment and I'm willing to, to face up to it. Just like when I press, you know, start stream on my OBS stream labs, and then suddenly all the creativity and room and space and ideas and jokes and things that I want to do just like get crunched and, and crushed as I'm you know, occupied by how's my sound quality? Can you hear my voice? It's the, the video transmitting or the other concerns taking up space in my mind. And so the ability to create gets substantially reduced. But what may very well be going on is that I walk around with excessive anxiety but because it's so chronic, I don't even realize that, that there has to be you know, certain situations that make me face my anxiety. And so the situation of pressing start stream makes me confront the excessive amount of uh, anxiety that I may walk around with, but ignore because it's chronic. But certain situations like pressing start stream, then I can't, can't run away. I can't fool myself anymore about, say, the perhaps maladaptive amounts of anxiety I have going on in my life. Hey guys, right, this is history I'm going speaks. to talk today about colorful personality who has come into this sphere of Holocaust denial named Ryan Falk, or the alternative hypothesis. Falk is a social media personality, Twitterer and so on, who presents himself as a bold nerd who thoroughly, painstakingly researches historical and contemporary topics, and he debunks basically woke or liberal establishment memes on race and the history of World War II and so on. This branding of his as an industrious nerd is mere bluster. As I'll show, he is a deeply lazy and superficial individual who draws his worldview from the empty-headed memes of the internet gutter. Like, we're talking image board level. The branding is a total fraud. So my series in him is going to focus on his views on World War II. He denies German responsibility for starting the war, <laughs> and denies any German aggression against Chechia, which is quite humorous as we'll get to. This video specifically will focus on a simple premise which Falk continually uses to justify his Holocaust denial. And that is that all Holocaust claims, meaning mass murder, gassing, mass killing, and so on, are founded on evidence produced by the Soviet Union, especially after the war. In other words, Hall Maltheib contends the Soviet Union fabricated evidence for the Holocaust after the war. More specifically, he alleges that gas chambers were a hoax, and that this hoax is borne out by the fact that the only homicidal gas chambers, in his claim, not mine, were found by the Red Army. And to boost the plausibility of his claims in this regard, Hyde claims that the Holocaust was essentially covered up during the war until the Soviets liberated the death camps and then supposedly fabricated the evidence for it. His claim is that the Holocaust was fabricated by the Soviet Union. I'm going to discredit that on three grounds. First, I'm going to point out that the evidence for the Holocaust did not emerge with the Soviet Union. It emerged with the Polish government in exile, primarily, and was widely known by Allied and Axis governments alike during the war. Second, in response to the claim that, oh, the Red Army liberated Auschwitz, a big extermination camp, how can we trust them? Well, the Western Allies, the British and the... Okay, this is a PhD student, PhD student at the London School of Economics, PhD student in history, Matthew Gabriel. He's been a guest on this channel many times. Americans specifically carried out independent investigations without the Soviets involving whether there were gassings at Auschwitz and concluded there were. Through the Belzen trial and the IG Farben trial, these Western nations, the judicial systems, concluded there were gassings. This was not just investigated by the Red Army. And third, actually, the Western Allies did liberate camps that had had gassings, gas chambers, and mass killings. For example, the Nazweiler concentration camp, where 86 Jews were killed in four days, that gas chamber is intact today. The gas chambers at Mauthausen, where thousands were killed during the Holocaust, um, in groups of many dozens at a time, I think it could be up to 80. And also the gas chambers at Hartheim Castle, which were not only used to kill the victims of the so-called euthanasia program, but thousands of concentration camp inmates, including Jews and Poles, so inmates from Dachau and Mauthausen. So, okay, let's get into my first point against the Althype's claim that the Soviets fabricated the Holocaust, and that is the Polish government in exile, not the Soviet Union, the Polish government in exile, was the first really to raise broad public awareness about the Holocaust, especially through the publication of the booklet, The Mass Extermination of Jews in German-Occupied Poland, in early 1943, the Americans and the British were well aware of the extermination of the Jews during the war. There's scholarship such as Richard Brightman's Official Secrets, as well as 
Right, so if a group is being genocided, that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to put aside your national interests. Like, it was completely uh, reasonable and responsible for the Allies to make their primary concern winning the war rather than engaging in you know, dangerous, uh, unlikely, and far-fetched attempts to try to end the Holocaust. The reasonable and responsible approach was exactly what the Allies focused on, winning the war. That's the most effective and most you know, commonsensical approach to ending the Holocaust. But uh, just thought about another point that I wanted to make on the main topic for, for today, and that is the use of, by invariably, incredibly successful, uh, frequently elite commentators to dismiss hate facts or perspectives or arguments that they don't want to deal with, and that is to describe them as ugly. So I remember I took two classes at UCLA with economics professor Russell Roberts. He was a big influence on me. He was a Baal Tshuva, someone who was raised pretty much a secular Jew and then became an Orthodox Jew as an adult. And he had an influence on me that in, in part led to my conversion to Orthodox Judaism. And about uh, six, seven years ago, I was interacting with Russell Roberts publicly on Twitter where he was decrying white identity as ugly. And I said to him, if, if pursuing your Jewish identity and growing your Jewish identity is a beautiful thing, then what's wrong with you know, other people, say, growing in their racial identity? And his response was, it is ugly. So when you get premier intellectuals, particularly very successful people who are often elite, uh, making, making the argument that uh, certain facts or certain arguments are ugly, you know that if they had facts, they'd come at you with facts, that if they had logic, they'd come at you with logic, right? If they had you know, some persuasive, logical, factual basis to debunk what you're saying, they'd come to you with that. But when they don't, they use these really dumb aesthetic arguments that, oh, you know, certain identities, it's beautiful. And uh, you know, other forms of identity, they're, they're just ugly. So yeah, if you are really strong into, say, building your white identity, you're not going to be very happy or successful in the United States, England, Australia, uh, France, Germany right now. Right? This is not an environment because so many people who are interested in their white identity you know, go out and do heinous things and start shooting people up. So a normal, normal reaction to people who are concerned about their white identity is go, ah, you know, do we have a, you know, a freak on our hands? Uh, on the other hand, you know, pursuing your Jewish identity or your gay identity or your Muslim identity or your minority identity, that's much more socially acceptable. But even still, in our multicultural world, if your identity pursuing, particularly on racial grounds, you know, black, brown, yellow, you know, black, uh, Latino, Asian, you know, you're going along at a 7, 8, 9, 10 out of 10 in intensity, uh, glorifying and pursuing your, your racial identity, you're probably not going to do too well. There's going to be pushback even even in you know, your, your perhaps uh, sacred and, and protected minority status. Generally speaking, in a multicultural society, you know, people tend to be less and less uh, comfortable with those who are obsessed with their racial identity. Even something as socially acceptable as developing your Jewish or your, your gay or your Muslim identity, all right, at a certain level of intensity, you're going to grate on people. Right, it's not going to work out. On the other hand, if you're in a situation of grave peril, right, if you're in a dangerous situation where outgroups, right, you know, very likely to cause you irreparable harm, then developing your in-group identity is, you know, probably a commonsensical strategy. But now, generally speaking, in the West, uh, generally speaking, we're fairly prosperous, fairly safe, and so developing, you know, a hyper in-group racial identity is not going to is something that works out well for you when interacting with others. Bernard Wasserstein's Britain and the Jews of Europe, 1939-1945, conclusively demonstrates their awareness. The British, particularly because of their decodes, had this knowledge at hand. The Axis knew about and believed the Holocaust was going on. So I'm talking Hitler's allies, Italy, Hungary, Romania, the leaders of these countries. For instance, there was an intelligence report produced by the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on 4 November 1942, and it was actually notated as seen by Mussolini and Ciano, regarding the Jews sent to the east from the German-occupied zone of France, that they are, quote, eliminated by means of toxic gas. 
The Hungarian regent Horthy declared in a Crown Council meeting on 19 March 1944, Hitler was furious with him because Horthy was not allowing the Jews to be taken to Germany and killed in the extermination camps or killed in Hungary. To quote what Horthy said, Hitler protested to me about Hungary not taking the necessary steps against the Jews. Our crime is, therefore, that I have not fulfilled Hitler's wish and have not allowed the Jews to be massacred. Horthy is saying Hitler's wish is for the Jews to be massacred in a meeting whose minutes were recorded. Not a post-war Soviet invention. Horthy is saying during the war, Hitler's wish is for the Jews to be massacred. In this, we're going to have to ask out hype. What do you make of the fact that other Axis leaders believed in the Holocaust and the extermination of the Jews? I mean, I've used that term at the time. Ooh, good point. But they knew about the extermination of the Jews. What do you make of that? If the Holocaust is truly a dumb conspiracy theory, a propaganda invention of the Soviets, as you say, why did Hitler's own allies believe in it? Far from being a propaganda invention of the Soviet Union, ironically, the Holocaust was a subject Soviets frequently censored and very seldom discussed. The subject is a- So I've never cared for old hype's analysis or for his uh, friend, is it Sean Last? I've never found it convincing. I, I know- you know, alt-right Jews who quite like Alt Hype and, and Sean Last. I just find them you know, incredibly shallow and incredibly emotional, but they try to, you know, distract from the emotion underwriting whatever it is that they're doing by, you know, citing a lot of manipulated and distorted facts. Explored in great nuance in Kirill Pfefferman's book, Soviet Jewish Stepchild, The Holocaust and the Soviet Mindset, 1941 to 1964. And Pfefferman shows that there were some periods during the war and post-war where the Soviet officials did publicly acknowledge exterminations, but these were far and few between. And they also sometimes allowed public discussion of it. But again, the general Soviet tendency, according to Pfefferman and all the evidence, was to suppress and censor mention of the Holocaust. And why did the Soviets do this? Why did they want to censor evidence and discussion of the Jewish Aside. They did this because they wanted to serve their propaganda narrative of the war, according to which Soviet citizens in general, and not Jews specifically, were the primary victims of Nazism. They had the crown of victimhood. In fact, Stalin only mentioned the Holocaust once during the war. It's a 6 November 1941 speech, which commemorates the anniversary of the October Revolution, and Stalin says the Nazis... Yeah, a lot of uh, good, good videos there made by Matthew Gabriel on his History Speaks YouTube channel. All right, Washington Post story here. Pittsburgh confronts anti-Semitism as Tree of Life shooting trial nears. Robert Bowers faces 63 charges in death penalty case for the 2018 mass shooting as hate-fueled violence continues to rise. Uh, couldn't this shooting, in, in addition or in, in replacement for anti-Semitism, maybe it's like an anti-immigration shooting. He didn't just go to any random synagogue. He went to synagogue that... Uh, actively identified with the Hebrew Immigration Society, who has an agenda to bring in a large number of uh, refugees. Sean Lars has an incredible wealth of knowledge, says the chat when it comes to HBD facts, can't say anything about his Holocaust take. Yeah, I just don't trust him because his, his analysis so frequently seems to be incredibly distorted. So let's have a little listen here to this... Uh, Washington Post story. So it's called an anti-Semitic attack. Yeah, it clearly seems to be an anti-Semitic attack, but he didn't just attack any you know random group of Jews. He attacked a particular group of Jews who threw in with the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which has an agenda of bringing in as many refugees to the United States as possible. So isn't it common sense that he was perhaps uh, just as motivated or even more motivated than by anti-Semitism, by anti-refugee or anti-immigration beliefs? Like, why do we, why do we just automatically, you know, label it uh, anti-Semitism and hate-fueled? Maybe he was, you know, fighting for his his particular vision of uh, what he wanted this country to be, and he thought there was an excessive amount of uh, immigration. And great, just as I. Click, uh, click play here. It uh, doesn't work. Let me see. Let me see what... ...begins for the highly anticipated trial of the accused Tree of Life synagogue shooter, Robert Bowers. This time has brought back to the surface for many uh, all the pain of four and a half years ago. Seven one uh, suspects talking about uh, all these Jews need to die. I... Yeah. Was he 
Was he arguing that all Jews need to die? Was he arguing that Jews who are conducting themselves in a manner opposed to his interests, as opposed to his vision of the United States that he wanted them to be rid of, just like many Israelis you know, chant death to the Arabs because they, they see the Arabs as an existential threat to the type of culture and country that they want to create. Right? Different groups have different interests when these interests clash because resources are limited and human desires are infinite, right? When you have this dramatic clash of interests, that's when you get uh, mass killings. I think about my mother every day. I think about what happened to me every day. I have wounds to, to remind me every day. So if convicted, he could face the death penalty. Survivors, victims are bracing for weeks of testimony they fear could re-traumatize the community. Here it is. I love this picture. My mother loved purple. My mom was Rose Mallinger. She was a special lady. She loved her family, first and foremost. My parents joined the Tree of Life Synagogue before it was even at Wilkins and Shady. They joined when they got married. We all grew up there. So we don't get to determine how other people treat us, but we do have a vote, right? We don't have a veto, we do have a vote. So how Jews behave, how Christians behave, how Muslims behave, how gays behave, how any group behaves, it's going to have an influence on how other people treat it, though it's not going to necessarily be determinative. So if your group gets attacked, that doesn't mean you've done things wrong, that you're bad that you brought it on yourselves, but it is worth questioning, was there some you know, choices that uh, the group made that increased the odds of bad things happening? If you walk alone in, in a bad part of town and then you get attacked and robbed or, or beaten or worse, right? you don't deserve to be beaten, but you played a significant role in your own suffering. And I'm not saying these people, you know, these individuals played a significant role in their own suffering. I say that uh, individuals and groups in general often play a role. You know, I'm not going to say these, you know, these poor people who, who got shot and killed. I'm not, not condemning them by, by any means. I'm saying that uh, as individuals and as groups, we sometimes, we often have an effect on how other people relate to us. And we all thought she would have lived to at least 100 because she, she was sharp as a tack. She... And the chat says, but then why did he single out Jews? Why didn't he target those who promote immigration? Well, if you're a particularly effective and influential group who has an outsized impact on society, you have you know, amounts of, of power, influence, uh, money, uh, productivity, accomplishment, then you are going to attract you know, far more attention, both positive and negative, than groups which have a below average amount of power, influence, productivity, accomplishment, money. So Jews have been particularly influential in the United States. They have you know, created many businesses. They have been disproportionately influential in culture, in, in politics, in, in business, in parts of academia in parts of the profession, such as the medical, legal, dental, accounting professions, with great power, with great influence, with great success, comes added scrutiny and added pushback. She just, she just loved life. So she was 97 when she was killed. There were two people who were the shot. The overall thing that helps survive. me move forward is that I'm alive. Uh, I came very close to death. My mother was very strong, and I feel that I have strength through her. Charlottesville was a watershed moment for American Jews, I think more so than any other moment to see um, all those people carrying torches. What well, was a watershed moment for Jews arming themselves and improving security. It was not so much this 
Tree of Life shooting that killed 11 Jews. It was the next shooting in San Diego that killed one Jew. But this was then the second shooting. You then saw a dramatic upsurge in Jews getting armed, getting trained, and upping their security. So when I grew up a Seventh-day Adventist, I don't recall once having security outside of the churches that I'd attend. But every substantial synagogue I've attended on, on the Sabbath has had armed security. Chanting Jews will not replace us. So that kind of, I think, opened the door. But the Tree of Life massacre blew the doors off the hinges. As the suspect keeps telling them about uh, killing Jews, uh, he doesn't want any of them to live. And it's said to, sadly to every... Okay, so what people say, particularly in times of stress, is not necessarily 100% x-ray to their soul. I wouldn't dismiss it and say it, you know, it means nothing. You know, obviously, uh, Mel Gibson, when he'd get drunk and rant about Jews, that reflected some real animus that he had towards Jews. But you can't take people 100%, literally, this you know, sums them up when under you know, times of extreme stress, they, they say extreme things. All right synagogue in the United States. We're not safe anymore. Do you think we as a country are in a better place now? Well, there are plenty of Americans who don't feel safe due to the large amount of immigration that we allow into the country. There are Americans who don't feel safe because gay marriage is the law of the land. That violates their hero system. And, and why is you know one hero system invariably superior to another hero system? So let's say you have a liberal hero system that celebrates gay marriage and then you have a different hero system that regards marriage as exclusively a heterosexual institution between one man and one woman if the latter if your traditional conception of marriage is an integral part of your hero system then the supreme court mandating gay marriage is going to be experienced as a violation of your hero system as a threat to everything that you hold sacred if you view the U.S. military as a heterosexual institution, then uh, mandating the inclusion of, of gays into the U.S. military will be a violation of your hero system. If you regard Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, uh, any body or any institution that denies that or decries that or denigrates that, you're going to experience that as an attack on you, right? Not just on your hero system, but on you. If you believe that uh, Muhammad was the greatest of the prophets and that God revealed the ultimate and most clear expression of his will through Muhammad, any criticism, any denigration of Muhammad and the Quran, you're going to experience that as an attack on yourself. So liberalism in part means that we accept that we cannot reach you know, final agreement on many of these ultimate issues, and therefore we're going to try to create a, you know, a safe space for many different uh, points of view, but ultimately, the state cannot be neutral, right? Since the Thirty Years' War, liberal states in, in the First World have increasingly tried to neutralize issues such as uh, religion and remove it from the political. But in attempting to neutralize and remove from the political, you often then you know, rub against and, and denigrate and you know, reduce the, the safety of people who have a particular hero system, such as those who believe that Christ is king and you know, non-Christians should not be allowed to vote or non-Christians should not be allowed to rule over a, a Christian country, all right? the, the, you know, the presence of Jews or Muslims or Buddhists or Baha'i in positions of power it will, will be very painful to those who have a particular Christian type of hero system. I do not. I see increased polarization since 2018, the number of hate crimes have gone. So when do you have increased polarization? Is it just the product of social media? Is it the product you know, of hateful speech? No, it's primarily the product of individuals and groups have very real conflicts of interest. So let's say you grew up in a, a white Christian community and then that, that white Christian community becomes, say, a darker skinned Muslim community. All right, that community where you once feel safe, right? When you go back there, what's what's happened to your community is going to be a violation of your hero system, and you're going to feel less secure in the world, right? Everybody needs a place. Like every living thing, from plants to animals 
tries to create an environment in which they are most likely to thrive. And so it would make sense that the Christians, you know, want an environment that's most conducive to the thriving of Christianity, that Jews would want an environment most conducive to the thriving of Jewish life, that Muslims want an environment most conducive to Muslim life thriving. And these clashing hero systems, these clashing, clashing visions of, of thriving produce very real conflicts of interest. But when the intensity of the conflict of interest is sufficiently high, you get killing and slaughter and tragedy. On up to basically record levels. The idea that the community is trying to make a statement with a conviction uh, in this trial, but also in the work that they've done since then, come against that broader real challenge that, uh, if anything, that's only got to be the beginning of the work. One day doesn't take away from all the joyous events that have been in that building. They had a ceremony to say goodbye to the building. Most of the building is going to be torn down and rebuilt. We gathered uh, Sunday, April 23rd, the day before jury selection began, to say Lehit Ra'ot. Lehit Ra'ot is a Hebrew word. It means until we see each other again. We had asked everyone to bring a small stone as a sign of respect. Uh, we laid out the stones. We also have mezuzah on the doorpost of the synagogue. So as one final act, we removed the mezuzah from the doorpost uh, of the synagogue. I have it here in my office. So most Jews in America would oppose the death penalty, and Israel is officially opposed to the death penalty, but they used it for Eichmann. And I'm sure many American Jews who generally oppose the death penalty, they want to institute the de death penalty against Robert Bowers, who killed 11 members of our tribe. Um, it's been cleaned up. And when the new building opens, we will reaffix the mezuzah back onto the building. So do you think the production of, say, hundreds of these calming, soothing, you know, pro-Jewish pro videos are going to reduce real conflicts of interest between groups? No. Right, this is going to be soothing for people who want this particular message, but it's not going to do away with the reality of, of biology that uh, different forms of life often have different interests and try to create different environments. What do people hope this trial will do? There isn't an answer. We've proven resilience. We will again prove that we are resilient and move onward because there will be life after. So generally speaking, Jews in America oppose the death penalty, but certainly many Jews will support the death penalty for Robert Bowers. It's in the Washington Post. Rosenthal family says they support Good the Good afternoon. Family. My name is Diane Rosenthal, and I am here with my sister, Michelle. We are the sisters of Cecil and David Rosenthal, who were murdered in the synagogue shooting at the Tree of Life in Pittsburgh on October 27th. And another you know, lesson that could come out of this is that there was no armed security guard. I don't think there was any security guard at this synagogue. And you still have Jews decrying the use of armed security guards, right? Even recently, they're, they're publishing op-eds in prestigious journals. So it's always easier to primarily place the, the blame on outgroups and people doing heinous things. It's also worth asking, you know, where did we as, as a group, as a community you know, go wrong? Where did we make perhaps bad decisions that facilitated, you know, this horrible event? And so you know, Jews who refused to have armed security on Saturday morning synagogue services are placing themselves in a much more vulnerable position. In 2018, it was not our intention to speak about the legal proceedings until after the trial, but we felt the need to speak up and correct this prevalent misconception before it continues. The suggestion that all the family members of the deceased victims do not wish to proceed with a death penalty case is false. To set the record straight, back in July of 2021, seven of the nine families who lost loved ones wrote a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland 
reflecting our support in seeking the death penalty in this particular tragedy. This remains our family's position today and the other six families who co-authored this letter have given us permission to share this letter with you following our comments today. This massacre was not just a mass murder of innocent citizens during a service in a house of worship. It was an anti-Semitic hate crime. The death penalty must apply to vindicate justice and to offer some measure of deterrence from horrific hate crimes happening again and again. Of the 63 counts the defendant is charged with, 22 are eligible for the death penalty. Each of the 22 death eligible counts directly corresponds to one of the 11 deceased victims. The suggestions published or reported that family members be relieved of the stress of a trial or that a cost benefit analysis dictates a plea are offensive to our family. This plea. Okay, saying that this or that is offensive is not a strong form of argument, right? It's one of the most common forms of argument and one of the weakest. It is right into the hands of the ongoing transparent strategy by the defense to delay in hopes of achieving this result. Our family has suffered long and hard over the last four and a half years. We don't want to have to continue to defend ourselves and our position. We want justice. We want the legal system to work as it should and have the perpetrator brought to trial and judged by a jury based on the facts of the case. So if you in general are opposed to the death penalty, but when it comes to you know Jews who are hurt, then, then suddenly you want the, the death penalty, right? Uh, members of our groups may look at that askance, right? Completely understandable, psychologically speaking, but if you promote, you know, a double standard for how people should be treated, treated on the basis of whether or not they, they harm Jews, right, it's reasonable to be, expect that, you know, many non-Jews will not be, not be thrilled by that. And it used to be socially unacceptable, right? It used to be socially unacceptable for any minority group to place the interests of their group ahead of the nation state of the United States of America. But since the 1960s, it's become increasingly acceptable for, for various minority groups to place their own group's best interests ahead of, of that of the country. So Bradley Shavit Artson is the head of the rabbinical school at the University of Judaism, which is a conservative Judaism institution in Los Angeles. And I remember he wrote and he spoke about how he stopped putting on tefillin, how he stopped performing various Jewish rituals, and how he came to have a big problem with God because six million Jews died in the Holocaust. So hundreds of millions of Jews, uh, of non-Jews in, in history have been slaughtered, tortured, raped, and, and that didn't cause you know, Rabbi Artson to uh, you know, have negative feelings about God or to stop performing various Jewish rituals such as putting on tefillin. But when he thought about how Jews had suffered, right, then he was mad at God, right? So uh, members of our groups are not necessarily going to have, you know, a great deal of respect for for this type of, you know, in-group versus out-group morality. Okay, let's see if there's anything going on here with Fox News. Have instantly gone to work sweeping away the shocking conclusions of special counsel John Durham's report. The media won't relay facts from the report honestly because, of course, the media were complicit in the absolute con from the start. We are in parallel universes because Donald Trump and many conservative media people see this Durham report as a vindication of the former mm -hmm. president and that the FBI uh, probe should never have been started. At the same time, most of the mainstream media have been knocking it down. They are so invested in the Trump-Russia collusion saga. Uh, and, and, and it's hard. And what they're saying is it's a nothing burger. It's a waste of time. Uh, it is uh, not one person went to jail. Hardly the crime of the century that Trump predicted it would be. So you have these completely different. And it is certainly true that, that because Journalists uh, spend so many years uh, uh, covering this, I would say over covering this, I would say over hyping this, uh, they can't quite let it go. They won Pulitzers. 
uh, won Pulitzer's for the New York Times and the Washington Post. And it just seems to me that um, this it's like deja vu. This has been going on for years. It's never going to end. Well, and hearing one of those bites that was this investigation should have never happened, it was about Durham, not the crossfire hurricane. Kevin. That's right. You Look, could use that bite either way. You, you, you could. And, and I would just say, regardless of what someone thinks about President Trump politically, that if you take a step back and look at the FBI from a, a policy and ideas point of view, it's clear that it's become politically weaponized. Ask Mark Houck in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Ask the pro-life activist who's being hounded this weekend, probably as we sit here, Shannon, by two FBI agents. Ask anyone who's a reasonable conservative, and you know that this is an agency, and I mean this very intentionally as a policy objective. It needs to be started over from scratch and rebuilt. This is not a law enforcement agency. It's a political weapon. Well, well wait a second. If I imagine if I knew Hillary, you might disagree with that. Imagine if Hillary Clinton... Okay, let's have a look at the chat. How much of synagogue security is subsidized by the state? A uh, considerable amount of synagogue security is subsidized by the state. State subsidies are handed out basically in proportion to hate crimes. So the more hate crimes and shootings there are of Jews, then a higher proportion of state subsidies are handed out to uh, Jewish institutions, which doesn't seem unreasonable. Okay, let me take the edge off with a little more Alan Berger here to wrap things so up. So there's already so much that's being activated. You know, the fires of change are being stoked with step one is the way I like to think about it. And this is what Dr. Brandon says about, about acceptance. He goes, to accept is more than simply to acknowledge or admit. So hear that. To accept is more than simply to acknowledge or admit. It is to experience. It is to stand in the presence of the reality. It's to contemplate the reality, to understand what that means for you, to absorb and start to integrate that reality into our consciousness. You've seen Herb do this a million times. He talks about, it's not about here, it's about here. You have a lot of information, but no transformation. That's what acceptance is. It's moving things from here to here. It's an experience of who we are and what we are. So with that being said, I will turn it over to Herb and we'll have his comments and then Roger. So where are you, my friend? I need to- I'm, I'm definitely here. <laughs> I know you are, but I, let me, I have to get out of here. Mm -hmm. All right, tag, you're it. Thank you very much, Alan. Um, yeah, and, and you also gave me a, a new perspective for how we're approaching this, which is applying each of the steps to all of the pillars. And so that helped me a lot because I, I wasn't, I, I hadn't broadened my lens sufficiently to incorporate that. <clears throat> and you used the, spent some time with admit, which is in fact the word in step one, admit to our innermost self. And yet Bill uh, in the big. Yeah, my first few years of recovery, I, I didn't really do enough admitting, but when I worked step one thoroughly, I remember I kind of walked around in moderate version of shock for weeks when I just came to terms with the extent of the damage that my out of control behavior had done to me and, and to other people, the, the extent to which I'd ruined my life through bizarre attention seeking, through you know, selfishness, through you know, treating other people instrumentally to try to meet my needs, through my self aggrandizement, through, you know, just uh, uh, crazy, irrational, you know, hateful, spiteful, nasty behavior. Just seeing the damage that I'd done, like admitting was a really big step for me becoming more aligned with reality. And it still is on an ongoing basis when it's like, oh my God, you know, I admit that I spoke out of turn, that I, I took what was not mine, that I trespassed on other people's boundaries, that I you know, made a joke that made you know, various women feel unsafe. The book has a much more profound in the way that you were suggesting it, much different than just admit or accept. He has a much different word. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's there is a solution. Uh, on page 30, he says, we need to concede to our innermost self that we are not. And a question in the chat, could 40 discuss the dignity of the victim in Jewish thought? So the only Jewish teaching, which I believe is repeated in all five of the books of the, the Torah, is that if man sheds blood, then by man must his blood be shed. So to honor the dignity of the victim, the perpetrator 
generally speaking, must be put to death for committing murder. It's an absolute essential pillar of the Jewish perspective on life, that you're not respecting the dignity of life if you allow those who gratuitously and spitefully and maliciously uh, take the life of innocent people to continue to live. Like other people. Concede is very much along the lines that you were talking about to our innermost self, much deeper than just admit. Um, and this is a huge problem in our society. Like we are incentivizing bad behavior by not punishing it. All right. When you allow bad behavior and don't punish it, right, you incentivize people to take what is not theirs. They, they might try to take your bike, right? They may try to take your car. They may try to take your money or your food or your property or your woman, right? And when you don't punish people who do these heinous things, <clears throat> when you incentivize people to not even call the cops or to not even call out for help, but instead you punish people who are being victimized, like that pregnant physician assistant in New York City who'd paid for a bike and then these youths surround her and mock her and claim that what was hers was not hers, right? And then you shame and punish her for asking for help from people who are stealing from you. Then you warp society, right? When you allow the homeless to make filthy public spaces and allow them to be aggressive towards innocent people to reduce the quality of life on public transport and in public space, particularly in, in downtowns of cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, uh, New York City, and you don't punish them for their antisocial, destructive, you know, cruel, mocking, dangerous behavior, then you're just incentivizing people. If people can take that which is yours, including your ability to enjoy public space, and you don't punish them for it, you're effectively incentivizing more and more of this bad behavior. So we have to realign our justice system and the way we conduct things, particularly in our biggest cities, so that people who do bad things are promptly and effectively and appropriately punished, while people who do good things are protected and praised and incentivized to continue to be law-abiding, productive citizens. And that is about becoming conscious. My process is, is so exemplifies what you um, elaborated there in that I'm age 43, I'm going to support my wife's recovery in a hospital program. They asked me to look at my drinking. I thought that's just part of the d drill for supporting hers. And I'll, I'll talk about my history. And, and for the very first time, age 43, with a graduate education in psychology and lots of therapy and human development, I did this autobiography of my relationship with alcohol. And I began to see. And it's worth writing an autobiography of one's relation to alcohol or one's relationship to sex or to romance or to sports or to uh, Netflix or to flame wars, right? Now, how, how have flame wars played a role in your life? You know, to what extent have you found meaning, purpose, uh, joy, thrills from flame wars? And uh, has, has that really served you? As a historical bullet point from age 12 to age 43, 30 years of periodic loss of control to the extent that it was very visible. We're talking about so in my you know, sexual and romantic history, it's just frequent loss of control, loss of, of good judgment, that uh, the power to make you know, wise, sober decisions in the area of you know, sex and romance is, is not a power that I have sustained over the course of my life. Right? Generally speaking, I'd be better off taking advice in sex and romance from a stranger in the park than relying on my own judgment. Same too goes with, say, underrunning, at uh, times with regard to debting, with regard to living life in community and, and uh, halting some of my inclinations to you know, make jokes or to be the center of attention to try to preserve a you know, safe, happy space for myself in, in a community. Jails overnight and hospitals and lots of embarrassment without the details uh, to tonight, but I could see them and it began to shape the puzzle piece as the beginning of the information that I needed. But when I read it out to a public group in that hospital, as they had asked me to, it just washed over me as it. Yeah, it's one thing to write about, you know, the role of say uh, sports or, or gambling or alcohol in your life. You get some realizations doing that, but then when you read it aloud to other people, right, you're very likely to get more realizations.
Chat says, quoting from the Talmud, those who are merciful to the cruel will eventually be cruel to the merciful. And Brandon notes, animals who kill a person are usually put down. The underlying problem here is the state can't control and oppress the deceased. Yeah, but they can they can incentivize, you know, good behavior and they can disincentivize a bad behavior by, among other things, you know, using capital punishment for murderers. An experience. So my information that I got from writing it out began the process, but nothing happened to me until I read it out and I had an experience, a profound experience that... Right. Transformation doesn't usually happen until you bring other people into your life and into your recovery or into your attempts at transformation, all right? Usually we're not strong enough, disciplined enough, energized enough to change all on our own. We need to bring other people into our lives, people that we can be vulnerable with. I have a drinking problem. I wasn't embarrassed that I was a drinking problem. I was embarrassed that I had never seen it. So consciousness is so like the first pillar is so incredibly important to have that not just knowledge, as you indicated, uh, but the uh, the experience that goes hand in glove with changing then us at a radical level. Um, and, and it was. A, uh, so I attended this man's uh, weekly seminar. He took you know, 52 weeks to teach the, the 12 steps. And it, it was the deepest work that I've ever done. Like for me, it was more influential, more more shaping, more powerful than 10 years of psychotherapy uh, more than you know all the religion that i had ingested this weekly seminar with herb k looking at that suffering the suffering is what disturbs us which is the word he uses in step 10 you talked about i remember the first meeting i went to i i talked about uh, anger he was talking about how anger usually doesn't serve us and you know i raised my hand at one point and spoke up and said, uh, you know, I often find that I need anger to try to, you know, get things done, move through the day. And he suggested, why don't you just uh, you know, think about whether anger is serving you in your life? That was his comment to me. And I think after that, I pretty much shut up for the next 11 months and just took in what he was teaching. And then on the occasion I had a question, I, I would just go up to him and ask him privately. Uh, suffering is not such a bad thing. It's a good thing because it's a signal to us that something's amiss. And so then we can course correct. Um, in connection with step one, and you made the emphasis on unmanageability, what it really gives you also is this sense, not just of addiction, because there may be people here that aren't in addiction or it's not the issue. So there are people who teach the 12 steps in like, you know, one eight hour seminar or one seminar over the weekend. So Joe and Charlie used to do these kind of weekend seminars, right? And they're great, but this guy taking 52 weeks of you know, 90 minute to two hour classes, you, you get a depth that I had not experienced anywhere else. Issue, but unmanageability is really the issue where I could. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great insight. It's not really the addiction. It's not really drinking too much or you know having sex with the the wrong people in the wrong places in the, in the wrong ways. Is not so much the under earning or the overspending. The primary issue is unmanageability. Like, to, to what extent is my life unmanageable? Right? That's what I need to look at because you can get sober, you can abstain from acting out and still have an unmanageable life. So, emotional sobriety is much more conducive to a manageable life. And as long as your life is unmanageable, there's probably a lack of emotional sobriety see that although i have very strong willpower my willpower wasn't strong enough certainly to deal with my addiction but it wasn't even strong enough to deal with my life i did what i yeah like i had always had this idea that i had amazing willpower because i was able to run marathons and uh, there were weeks that were you know i'd work 90 or 100 hours and i thought you know my my self-control my self-will you know is enough to get me anywhere but when it came to matters of sex and love and uh, attention seeking, uh, my, my self will just did not get the job done. And so having to admit that there were various areas in my life where I consistently had trouble, where I consistently was making bad decisions, that kind of woke me up. Hey, I've got some unmanageability with my relationships. I've got some unmanageability with my desire for adoration and attention. I've got some unmanageability in my desire to 
participate in flame wars and to provoke and to instigate to be the center of attention to you know tick people off to infuriate people that i'm not using some good judgment here i'm constantly acting not just against my own best interests, but against the, the best interests of people who like me and include me in their lives. I didn't want to do and I didn't do what I wanted to do. My willpower was ineffective. And I became progressively over a long period of time aware of consciously aware of the ineffectiveness of my willpower and my effort to create the life that I wanted and that I really did need help. Step one, and, and Roger made it so clear in the original presentation about humility. Humility is just the so exercise, yeah, can definitely help. Like I probably suffer from excess anxiety and physical exhaustion through exercise is a fairly effective coping mechanism for anxiety. It enables me to get better sleep. When I don't sleep well, I am far more susceptible to self-destructive, selfish behavior where I step on the feet of other people and then they retaliate setting forth you know negative spirals of interaction when i don't sleep well i'm much more likely to make inappropriate jokes to speak and and act without due foresight so exercise calms me down helps me sleep better makes me less vulnerable to my underlying strata of poor judgment a realization of the truth and the truth was that on my own I'm ineffective with regard to my addiction, but also with regard to managing my life. In and I completely agree here with autistic. Merit says it's critical as diet, exercise, anything else is wholesome, holistic, well-integrated social connection is paramount. Yes. Right. There's nothing more important for, for my well-being than my being connected with other people. And that has a profound effect on the things I say on this show. All right. I don't do the edgy stuff that I used to do that got a lot more views and a lot more money and a lot more attention because I, I realized that that edgy stuff was, you know, destructive to the relationships and sense of community and, you know, prosperity that I was building. In, the, in, in an effective way where I'm producing a life that flourishes. I was not. I was restless, irritable, and discontented as a way. And so I periodically notice that I'm getting restless, irritable, discontented. This usually takes the form for me. I get increasing resentment and increasing sense of anxiety and increasing levels of self-hatred so washing over me. I just i am frightened to walk down the street. And these are all signs that uh, I need to return to, for me, to doing my recovery work. And that also includes some you know, meditation. Uh, and this is what, you know, centers me, like listening to people like Herb Kay and Alan Berger here and, you know, doing many of the exercises that they suggest and finding community with other people who suffer the, the same self-destructive compulsions as I suffer from. That is what I have found over the past 10 years is most effective at helping me to let go of unnecessary resentment, unnecessary fear, you know, unnecessary anxiety. Way of life as a state of being. And it was admitting that that was the humiliation that brought me to humility. The, the Glib Medley has a great line here. Disagreeability is inverse to hours of sleep. Yeah, I've definitely found that. And uh, Brandon said, it's edgy Luke who, who brought me here. Yeah, definitely time for, for edgy jokes, edgy insights. But, uh, you know, each edgemeister has to make appropriate judgments about, you know, what's really in his own best interest. Obviously, even doing a live stream on the controversial topics that I tackle now, even in the completely milk toast manner in which I tackle controversial topics these days, is still incredibly edgy and dangerous for my well-being, even doing a milk toast show like this. That sense of complete defeat. And then, Alan, you made a wonderful comment about integrity. And I, I, I could... Edgy Luke brought me here. I stayed for the animus. It's like... Uh, People who told me they used to look at my old blog, they, they came for the, the porn gossip, but they stayed for the Torah commentary. Connected it to Bill's suggestion and how it works, that it's about rigorous honesty. Now, I was able to do honesty in the beginning. Over time, it became more rigorous. But that's because I had accountability, again, bringing in that humility. I really need help. And it's in this case, it's... So I'm striving towards uh, more honesty, but I don't mean by that you know, more honesty about other people's shortcomings, <laughs> right? I mean, more honesty about, you know, my, my own struggles and my own failures and my own shortcomings. Human help, I needed a sounding board for transparency. And, and the combination of these kinds of things over a long period of time 
it was transformational. So that's my experience with it. I mean, Herb K says that it verges on the impossible to have recovery if you don't get decent sleep. And I, I would add it verges on the impossible to find recovery from negative compulsions if you don't you know, integrate and connect with other people. Thank you so much, Herb. All right, let me grab Roger and remove. Oh. Herb, you are one eloquent son of a gun, man. I got to tell you, I love, <laughs> I love how you, I love how you express yourself so much. As, Thank as you. Mary, my wife, uh, Mary Catherine Bridget Flanagan said, Herb. <laughs> so the host of this show, Alan Berg, is a psychologist. Uh, this guy, Roger Andes, is a therapist. Uh, Herb K is not a psychologist even though he did graduate study in it, I think he has a master's degree in psychology, but he's not a, a psychologist or a therapist. He is just someone who does seminars on the 12 steps and has 40 plus years of sobriety from alcohol. Kiss the Blarney Stone. <laughs> that, that's a great way to put it. That's a great way to put it as well. Thank you, both Alan and her for that. Um, gosh, I had some comments prepared, but you guys have stimulated a whole bunch of other connections and associations here. So I'll uh, Autistic Mary says, I watched Debbie Does Dallas solely in the role of a social commentator. I, I think I watched Debbie Does Dallas 3 and was viscerally moved by it while my father was in the next room, you know, studying the Bible, right? Uh, that's how out of control I was. I was engaged in autoeroticism to one of the versions of Debbie Does Dallas with like an open... Now, I was in the living room. My dad was in the kitchen. There was no closed door between us. You know, thank God he didn't walk in on me. But, you know, when I think about that, it's like, yeah, I was pretty out of control. I'll stumble along as, as best I can here. I will start. Alan, you had mentioned the importance of acceptance. Be Do people in L.A. still smoke cigarettes after AA meetings? Yeah. So AA meetings are meetings for people who are... Who are sex addicts who are trying to quit drinking <laughs> all right so huge amount of screwing around you know after aa meetings and a uh, large amount of uh, cigarette use and uh, coffee use and and candy use so it's usually a good strategy to try to you know, tackle first the addiction most likely to kill you and if to give yourself the strength to do that you need you know candy coffee cigarettes screwing around uh, that seems to be what happens so, yeah, I love that description of AA. See, room full of sex addicts who are trying not to drink. Because um, clearly that's a big part of what step one is about. Um, it's about alignment with reality, as you as you mentioned, Alan, and it's about acceptance as part of that alignment. It's about acceptance of reality. Um, and as I've heard you mention numerous times before, Alan, that one of the paradoxes that's implicit, at least in, in step one, is in admitting powerlessness. Admitting powerlessness allows those struggling with alcoholism and drug addiction to move to a more empowered position. Not right. So outsiders of 12 steps find this perhaps the most ludicrous part of 12 steps is admitting powerlessness as an escape from responsibility. But for some people, right, it is the beginning of responsibility because they're able to let go of the self-hatred. They're able to internalize this notion that they didn't, you know, choose to be addicts and they didn't choose to, you know, lose lose control. So they didn't have to hate themselves and loathe themselves and to turn away from the destruction that they have done. But by accepting this this framework of powerlessness, they are then ironically able to recognize that they've done a tremendous amount of damage in their life and they start to to clean it up because it's much easier for them to tackle this out of control addiction with this powerlessness language. So it's incredibly off putting. But that which sounds good doesn't always do good. And that which sounds bad isn't always a bad idea. There are all sorts of crazy, nutty, dispiriting, offensive ways of looking at the world that uh, help certain people in certain situations. And this notion of, you know, we're, we're powerless over our addiction to under earning or to alcohol, that seems to help certain people in certain situations, even though it drives the normal person, you know, crazy. It's the most absurd thing ever. Not in terms of self with a capital S or ego with a capital E, but in terms of subservience to... 40 sounds like you narrowly avoided what could have been a sticky situation. Yes. And I, I mean, <laughs> it kind of like killed my father, like the, the poor man. 
is uh, the criticism of Sexaholics Anonymous from other 12 groups that there is no end game. Yeah, there's a dramatic difference in the happiness levels of people in the sex 12-step programs and other 12-step programs. So generally speaking, people in AA, Narcotics Anonymous, most other 12-step programs, they're pretty happy, you know, humorous people, you know, who frequently exude a lot of joy. But overwhelmingly, the mood in 12-step sex programs is downbeat, discouraged, uh, dour. It, it just rarely do these programs have the other joy. It's it, it seems to be some people would say, oh, it's the, you know, the graduate school of addiction programs. But uh, yeah, for for most people, it, it seems like the 12 step sex addiction programs. They they have to work a lot harder. It's a lot more challenging. You just don't find the same consistency of joy and laughter in the and there are about a dozen 12-step related sex addiction programs that you do in something like AA or NA. Reality. Serving reality as best we understand it. Serving truth as best we understand it. Not easy to understand it. You know, I, we all have blinders. We all have blind spots. We all have, you know, what, what I will call in this moment, characterological distortions, right, of reality. Our, our ego needs see to that, right, and our defenses see to that. Reality can be an incredibly challenging and difficult thing to discern. But as we become more humble... And as we recognize that, I think we become more able to see more and more of, of reality as, as we go. In a chapter, chapter four of his book, How to Raise Your Self-Esteem, called Learning Self-Acceptance, Nathaniel Brandon wrote, if the essence of living consciously that Alan just referred to is respect for facts and reality, then self-acceptance is its ultimate test. Now, why is that? When the facts we must face have to do with ourselves, living consciously can suddenly become very difficult. <laughs> Here is where the challenge of self-acceptance enters. Self-acceptance asks that we approach our experience with an attitude that makes the concepts of approval or disapproval irrelevant. Instead, the desire is to see, to know, to be aware. I'll say that again. The desire is to see what's going on with us, what our consciousness is about, what our defenses are about, what our patterns are about, to see, to know, and to be aware. Now, to be self-accepting does not mean to be without a desire to change, improve, or evolve. The truth is that self-acceptance is a precondition of change. Now, that's an so I've always had this tremendous prejudice against, you know, anything to do with the self-esteem, but the, the first, the first writer on self-esteem who I respected was Nathaniel Brandon, who, who's being quoted here. So he was an acolyte of Ayn Rand. He had a you know, long ongoing affair with Ayn Rand while he was married to someone else. And uh, he's written some important books on self-esteem. Can't believe I'm saying that. And often a very confusing idea. In a form of therapy called Gestalt psychotherapy, there's an idea called the paradoxical theory or the paradoxical rule of change, which is in order to change, we need to more deeply become aware of and- How would my father have reacted if he walked in on me masturbating to pornography? He would have had just such pain. It would have been like a stab in the heart. He, he would have been devastated. He would have been worried. He would have lost sleep. It would just it would have been just so incredibly painful for him. And I would have been a tad embarrassed. It's not really a state that you want your, your father walking in on or your mother. I mean, George Costanza, I right, had that episode where he came over to his parents' house and they weren't there. So he's like looking through some uh, magazine like People and then one thing leads to another. And then his, his mother comes home and walks in on him and his trousers are down and he's kind of off balance when she walks in on him. And so he had the choice between, you know, pulling up his pants or falling flat on the, the floor. So he did not choose to pull up his, his pants. And uh, neither he nor his mother were really thrilled about that outcome leading to the Seinfeld crew making declarations that they were going to master their domain more deeply embrace the, the truth of our existing pattern the truth of what we are doing because as we take more ownership of what we are doing this kind of mysterious process happens now i'm pretty sure my father did not know what was going on in the, the living room it wasn't that he was avoiding it uh if, if my father ever thought anything it was like written across his face right he would have been a terrible poker player within us where we actually become more amenable to movement, more amenable to growth. 
the examples are countless. If, if I'm in denial of the pain I'm in, hard for me to do much about the pain I'm in because I won't express it. If I'm ashamed of it, humiliated by it, if I judge it, again, I won't go near it. I won't accept it. So it stays frozen inside of me. It stays intractable. If I start to talk about the pain I'm in, if I start to let the tears come, then things begin to move. My process begins to open up. And as that happens, change will happen. So the truth is, as, as Nathaniel Brandon put it, the truth is that self-acceptance is a precondition to change. Well, nothing could, is a better example of that than, than step one. Uh, Glib Medley says, hard to believe you couldn't get into Martin Amos. I didn't try that hard. There, there were two different books that I, I, I picked up and I just didn't make uh, much progress. I may have made it through his memoir. Uh, if I did finish one of his books, it would have been his year 2000 memoir. Ah, so Steve Saylor had uh, some good observations about uh, the death of, of Martin Amos. So Steve Saylor says, uh, Martin Amos's famous friendships with other writers with whom he'd have very passionate, often public disagreements, but it didn't affect his friendship with people like Christopher Hitchens and Ian McEwan, very similar to the friendships of his father Kingsley Amos had with his friends Philip Larkin and Robert Conquest. So in general, the Steve Saylor notes, the British and the Australians are much more into being mates, being pals than, than Americans. So Americans have a greater emphasis on freedom and individual accomplishment. Uh, the British and the Australians have more of an emphasis on, on mateship and social bonds. So mateship is really a beautiful thing. And one area where I've found it recreated in American life is in traditional Judaism. In both uh, conservative and orthodox Judaism, I've I've enjoyed uh, deep forms of effectively uh, mateship. Okay, I'm going to uh, take care. No, I'm not going to write 40s complaint. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye.